The Surfboard Slang, an Enchanted Coast Cozy Mystery, Enchanted Coast Magical Mystery Series, Book 2, written by Tegan Marr, narrated by Megan Kelly. Chapter 1 Excuse me, but may I use your sunscreen? I hate to be a mooch, but I seem to have gone through mine already. I pulled the towel off my eyes and leaned up onto my elbow on my poolside lounge chair, squinting as my eyes adjusted to the sun. A twenty-something woman with light skin and dark hair rested on her elbow facing me from the next chair over, her oversized sunglasses pulled up just enough that her chocolate-colored eyes were visible beneath them as she waited for my answer. She had a soft southern lilt to her voice. I tilted my head. Alabama or Mississippi, maybe? I heard the scrape of chair legs against the pavers when she'd claimed the chair half an hour ago, but hadn't bothered to look up. It was one of my few days off, and I was enjoying it poolside, soaking up rays in the adults-only infinity pool on the rooftop of the Enchanted Coast Resort where I worked and lived. I dealt with people enough when I was working that I enjoyed my solitude when I wasn't. The one exception to that was my familiar, a marble fox named Tempest. She hated both water and heat, so she'd opted to hang out at the cottage, napping, rather than hang with me at the pool. It only took one glance to realize the girl was a vampire, and likely a newly turned one at that based on the pink tinging her skin. The resort was charmed so that even vampires could enjoy the sun and amenities without burning or wanting to drain other guests dry. Older vampires could endure the sun almost as well as I, a regular Irish witch, could. Newer ones didn't have quite that much tolerance even with the magic. Sure, I said, pulling my bottle of SPF 50 from my beach bag and handing it to her. Thanks, she said, squeezing a glob out and slathering it over her shoulders and arms. She smeared some on her cheeks and nose, too, even though she was wearing an enormous floppy hat. I've always tanned rather than burned, but have recently acquired a health condition that makes me sensitive to UV rays. I tilted one side of my mouth up in a wry smile at the way she phrased it. I gathered as much. Go ahead and hang on to it. I have another bottle. Before I could roll back over and pretend I was alone again, she held out her hand across the space dividing our chairs. Marissa Clayton. So much for solitude, but manners prevailed over preference, and I reached out and shook her sunscreen slick hand. Destiny McGanty, pleased to meet you. She leaned back in her chair, and I did the same. A comfortable silence ensued for a few minutes. So, how long are you here for? She asked. I gave a mental groan. Don't get me wrong, I'm a people person, but I'd just come off a stretch of working 12, 10-hour days and just wanted to chill and detune. I've been here a little over three years and don't see myself leaving anytime soon, I said without taking the towel off my eyes. Three years? The confusion in her voice made me smile, and I relented. Yeah, but full disclosure, I work here. And now that I think about it, it's almost four years. She laughed. That makes more sense. I'm here for a month to get away from my life. I've got some tough decisions to make, and I'm not sure where I'm going to go from here. She gave a deep sigh and though I didn't want to pry, I felt like she was waiting for me to ask, so I did. Sounds like a lot of weight you're carrying. Major life change? Another sigh. You could say that. Marissa paused. You're magical, right? I mean, everybody here has to be, according to the brochure. That was another sign she was a noob. Most paranormals had a sort of second sense about other folks with magic, but newly turned vampires and shifters took a while to develop that even with their heightened sense of smell. To be fair, though, witches are tough to pick from a crowd outside of a place like the resort because we smelled almost like humans. Fortunately, we smelled just different enough to not smell tasty to vampires and carnivorous shifters. I am, I said, sitting up to see her. I'm a water witch. 
A look of understanding crossed Marissa's face, and she smiled. I should have guessed that from your smell. The pink tinge to her cheeks from the sun darkened just a bit more when she realized how her words sounded. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean it like that. I held up a hand and grinned at her discomfort. It was kind of refreshing being around somebody who still had the ability to blush. It's all good. I know what you mean. And you're a vampire. New to the life, right? Chagrin brushed across her face before she managed to hide it. Yeah, though not by choice. I cocked a brow. Turning a human was taboo except under specific circumstances, and the parent better be able to back up his or her decision to the higher-ups. She pulled in a deep breath, then released it. Despite the application of fresh sunscreen, her shoulders were turning a darker shade of pink. It wouldn't be much longer before she blistered. How about we move to the shaded end of the pool? I knew how quickly new vampires burned even under the protection of the resort's spells, and I didn't want to see that happen. One corner of the pool was covered by a large awning to provide shade for this very reason. We gathered our towels and beach bags and relocated to a table where she wouldn't fry to a crisp. The temperature was about 10 degrees cooler in the shade, so I wasn't exactly disappointed. Now you were saying you didn't choose to be a vampire? You know there are rules about that, right? Marissa nodded, then her face twisted with disgust. Yeah, it wasn't like that, though. I was hit by a pickup when I ran out of a bar after catching my low-down jerk of a boyfriend cozied up in a corner booth with a cocktail waitress. Okay, that still didn't explain how she'd ended up a vampire unless the truck somehow had venomous fangs in the grill. The guy driving the truck was a vampire, she said, then her voice turned bitter. I was stomping out of the parking lot madder than an old wet hen and not watching where I was going, and poor Ben, one of my late-night regulars, pulled around the curve from the main road and into the parking lot. When he hit me, it knocked me backwards into a swampy area, and a gator got me by the arm. I shook my head. That was some serious bad luck. Anyway, Marissa continued, pulling a bottle of faux blood from a little cooler she was carrying. It hit an artery when it bit down, and he got to me just before it dragged me off and finished me. Asked me if I wanted him to save me, and told me my life would change forever if he did. She huffed. I thought he meant something like I'd lose my arm, but I didn't have much choice. The blood was flowing out of that gash, and I was fading fast. Now I saw where it was going. The Good Samaritan hadn't done anything wrong per se. She'd been dying, and he'd saved her life. She popped the straw in the top of the box and took a pull from it. He had to shake me back awake twice before I said yes, and the next thing I knew, it was three days later, and I was completely healed. He took care of me for the next week, but then I got stubborn and went to work when he ran to the store. She paused, her gaze far away. I worked evening shift at the local 7-Eleven, and it took all of ten minutes before I was wanted to suck the life out of the guy I was working with. And trust me, the idea of putting any part of him in my mouth would have made me gag a week before. So, I went back home before I did anything stupid and sucked it up. Pardon the pun. The blisters on her shoulders were already healed, and feeling the tenderness on my upper legs, I was a little jealous that she wouldn't be itching and peeling in a few days like I would. And how long ago was that? Did he take care of you while you adjusted? She nodded. That was two months ago, and he did. I have to give him that, and he felt awful guilty about the whole mess. But the only thing he's guilty of is saving my life such that it is. She squared her shoulders. I'm lucky to be here, but now I have to decide what to do. It's not like once I leave here, I can just run back to the store. For one, it's a crap job, and for another... I don't trust myself yet. That's why Benjamin, the guy who saved me, recommended I come here. No temptation, and it would give me a chance to get away from the whole mess and get some perspective. How's that working out for you? I asked, genuinely curious. 
it had to be a tough spot to be in. Marissa gave a small smile, and I was pleased to see that her nose and cheeks were back to their normal near-white shade. Must be nice to have vampire healing. Better than can be expected, actually. Out there, when I was thirsty, people smelled better than fresh-baked bread, bacon, and coffee all rolled into one. I walked around drooling all the time and could barely focus on just walking down the street. I don't have that problem here, she said, wrinkling her nose. No offense. I smiled. None taken. So what about the career thing? She shrugged. With eternity ahead of me, lots of things I figured were out of reach seem a lot more doable now. Plus, not that I was dim before, but my brain works faster. I have options that extend beyond retiring as a manager of a convenience store. And what about Benjamin? She was young and pretty and seemed super sweet. I couldn't help but wonder if the connection and all that time together had kindled a flame. She waved me off and made an oh please face. Trust me, it's not like that. He's old-fashioned, as in 1700s old-fashioned. Plus, since he's the one who turned me, he's kind of paternal. He cares about me, though he has no idea what to do with a modern woman in the house. But now that you mention it, I've noticed several handsome men here, one in particular. I smelled gossip and hoped the conversation was taking a turn toward the juicy. She shut me down before I could ask. Enough about me, though, Marissa said, turning the conversation. What's it like working at a place like this? Do you live here, too? And is that a Georgia accent I hear? That surprised me a little. I still had a trace of an accent, especially when I'd had a drink or two, but I'd lost most of it in the years I'd been away. I smiled. Good ear. And it is. Northern Georgia. And yes, I do live here. I just took it as a summer gig a few years ago, but I fell in love with it. Since I'm a water witch and I hate the cold, it's the perfect place for me. I can't imagine doing anything else. She tilted her head. You know, that may not be a bad idea. Are y'all hiring? I need a job. I need a place to stay. And it's nice to be able to go out in the sun. Her mouth curved into a smile. And to talk to somebody without the distraction of thinking how they'd taste with crackers. I laughed. We're always hiring somewhere on the resort, but take your month and think about what you want to do before you make any decisions. Sounds good, she said as she slipped into the pool. Look, only here one day and I already have an option. Options are always a good thing, I replied, following suit and diving in. It was rare to hang out with somebody who didn't work at the resort, and I found myself enjoying the rest of the afternoon talking to her and getting to know her. I didn't have many friends, but she was a person I could picture being in my little circle. Chapter 2 the next morning, I squeezed some aloe into my hand and winced as I smeared the cold goop onto the tops of my thighs. The rest of me was fairly tan since I spent the majority of my life in the sun, but most of that time was spent in shorts that covered my more sensitive spots. In order to give it time to dry, I brushed my hair and put on what minimal makeup I wore before I stepped into my white work shorts. Glancing at my watch, I growled and snatched my apron off my bed then dashed out the door. If I didn't hurry, I wasn't going to have time to do inventory and place the liquor order before guests started trickling in. I was the head waitress and assistant manager of the resort's beach tiki bar, and as you may have already surmised, Enchanted Coast Resort was a resort designed for paranormals only. There were exceptions, but they were rare and made on a case-by-case -case basis. In general, that was for the best. Anywhere else we paranormals went, we had to hide who we were. This was the one place we didn't have to do that. As a result, we catered to every type of people from fairies to mermaids, and even the occasional angel. We even had a Valkyrie named Stephanie who regularly came to vacation with her battle steed, Buttercup. 
She was fun to drink with, but we made sure she left her sword in her room or behind the bar if she was going to be too fisting it. Security was tight, too. Nobody could teleport on the property except for me, Tempest, and Blake, the executive director of the resort, and my former fiancé. Despite that small detail, he was a good guy. He was the only one who could actually teleport off the property or into the main resort area. My clearance was limited to the boundaries of the property, which were substantial, and in front of Margot, the giant sphinx that stood guard in front of the main building. Blake was the only person who could teleport into or out of the actual main resort building. Blake had also created a spell that could lock down the entire property so that nobody could come or go in case of emergency. It was always a good idea to be able to contain the place when you were dealing with folks who could kill just by taking off a turban. Not that I'm singling out the Gorgons. It's just a good example of why beefed-up security is a must. Grabbing my apron off a small white side table by my door, I stepped outside my cottage, set my own wards, then snapped my fingers. A second later, I was standing outside the tiki bar, glad to see I was the first one there. We didn't technically open until 11, but there are always folks who operate on the premise that it's 5 o'clock somewhere, especially when they're on vacation on the Gulf of Mexico. Saying the words to unlock the wards on the tiki, I stepped inside, reset them, then headed to the office I shared with Bob, our Bigfoot bartender and co-manager of the tiki. When the position had come open a month earlier, everyone had assumed I'd take on the duties, but Bob had a family and would benefit from the pay raise, and he was also a better fit for the paperwork end of things. I knew the workings of the bar inside out, but I was better suited to keep things straight on the outside, so we decided to split the duties. Bob was a great guy, but a little too gentle sometimes to knock somebody who'd gotten too big for their britches down a peg or two. It was hard to imagine with their glorious manes and shiny horns, but drunken unicorns are scary. You'd think, considering he was seven feet tall with hands big enough to crack coconuts, I'd seen him do it. He'd have a little more grit, but he was a lover, not a fighter, which, to be fair, was a dominant feature in his species. Anywho, I was the front of the house muscle, so to speak, and he did most of the books and made sure the place stayed solvent and running. We alternated taking inventory and placing the orders because we both hated doing it. And today was my day. Since I had to be there anyway, I always told Bob to come in an hour late so he could spend more time with his kids. I could bartend and serve for that long, and he was away from them too much as it was. For once, it wasn't miserably steamy, so I decided to sit at the bar instead of in the office to fill out the order once I'd done the inventory. The smell of sea air and sunshine combined with the crash of waves and the slight breeze that tickled the hairs on the back of my neck was manna to me. I'd just finished up and emailed the liquor order to Blake, who had to sign off on it, when my first guests arrived. A group of four twenty-something fairies came tripping around the corner from the main hotel, laughing and carrying surfboards. Of course, their looks were likely deceptive. It was just as possible that they were a century old as a couple of decades. Fairies lived long and aged well, but these four were obviously brothers. Hey guys, I said, standing up and heading behind the bar. What can I get you? Just waters, please said the first one, a tall guy with sun-kissed surfer boy hair and emerald eyes. As a matter of fact, they were all tall with surfer boy hair, though two of them were blonde and two of them had darker hair. The main difference between them was that they each had different colored jewel-toned eyes, which was a fairy treat. And they all had varying levels of a hangover if I was any judge. And I was. Come on, Evan, hair of the dog. The second guy said, shoulder bumping him. We're on vacation, and this is your last as a free man. Have a beer, bro. Ah, brothers. That explained why they looked so much alike. He turned to me. What else do you have? I listed them off, and he chose one, shooting a mischievous wink at Evan. He turned back to me and grinned. Make it four, and water too, please. The other two laughed and high-fived, and Evan gave in, though it was half-hearted. 
He was still a little too green around the gills to be craving anything with alcohol yet. I handed them menus, then poured their beers as they bellied up to the bar. So what brings you guys to the Enchanted Coast? I asked. One of them spoke up, motioning to Evan. He's getting married next week. We're here for one final hurrah before one of us is no longer footloose and fancy free. You better watch or you'll be next, Cedric, Evan told him, then glanced toward the quiet one at the end of the bar. Same goes for you, Kalen. It would do you good. Not me, man, Kalen said. I'm not ready for that. Pfft, Cedric said, shooting him a glower that implied he'd lost his mind. You got the only good one left. Besides, there's too much of this man to expect just one woman to handle. The only one left who hadn't spoken snorted. More like too much to expect one woman to tolerate, cousin. So I'd been a little off. Three brothers and a cousin. Still, the family resemblance was undeniable. Cedric tossed a coaster at him. Watch it, Dane. I know of one leggy brunette in particular who seems to have caught your eye the last couple of days. Could be you're the next one in line. Dane scowled at him, and his amber eyes darkened by a shade. Don't be an idiot. You know that's just flirtation. Twould be folly to think otherwise. Why? Evan asked. As the third son, you're free to marry whomever you choose. I'm the only one who has to marry within our clan. They might be more cautious with Kalen since he's the second in line, but you can do as you please. Dane's face twisted in chagrin. Tis likely they'd expect me to stay within my own race, though, or at least stick with a woman with a heartbeat. He sighed as he peeled his coaster apart, and the scowl on his face told me his brother had hit a nerve. Is the bride and her party here, too? I asked to break the tension. Kalen shook his head. Oh, no. It's just us. No women folk allowed on this trip. I rolled my eyes at his use of women folk, and he gave me a sideways glance. What? It's better than little women? Not by much. I quirked a brow and refilled the water glass he'd drained as soon as I'd handed it to him. See, Kalen? Cedric said. That's why you're single. You can't be a Neanderthal. These days, it's the woman who hits you with the club and drags you back to her cave. Kalen huffed a breath out of his nose. Not in this lifetime. His amethyst eyes reflected both horror and humor at the same time. I grinned and lifted a carefree shoulder. Don't knock it till you try it. The others burst out laughing, then as other guests trickled in, I drifted away from the conversation. They finished their beers and asked for the check, and the last I saw of them, they were headed toward the ocean, surfboards in tow. The gulf wasn't much known for waves because it's basically a big basin, so I closed my eyes and conjured some waves for them at the far end of the beach where they wouldn't bother those who were shelling or strolling in the surf. After all, at the Enchanted Coast, our goal was to give all our guests top-notch experiences. Chapter 3 Neat trick. A gruff voice behind me said, You know Amber and Dax are going to be at the water bar raising cane in a minute because their kids can hear that from a mile away. I turned and grinned up, and up, at Bob. I know, but I can't resist. When our guests want to surf, it's only right that we give them waves. He was probably right about Amber and Dax, though. They were a mere folk couple who were regulars because they lived nearby. They usually sat at our water bar, which extended several yards into the ocean, so that water folk who couldn't or didn't want to change forms could stay in the water. Their kids were adorable, and when I turned on the wave machine, as they put it, they'd nag Amber and Dax until they brought them over to play in the surf. I waved off Bob's warning because I remembered what Amber had said the last time they were in. They may be at the water bar, but they won't be raising cane this time. They'll thank me for the free entertainment and have a drink. You know Dax's mom is in from the Atlantic this week. From what Amber says, the woman should have been born a banshee. Amber will be glad for any chance to escape, and Dax probably will be too. 
As predicted, it wasn't 20 minutes later that the bell at the end of the water bar rang, indicating we had guests. I turned to see two of my favorite people on the planet smiling at me and giving me thumbs up. Glancing down toward where the fairies were surfing, I caught the glint of a couple small jewel-toned fins in the waves. Bob smiled and made their regular drinks and sat them on the server's space, along with sodas for the kids. A couple weeks before, Bob had started using wax to turn the fur above his lips into a huge handlebar mustache that curled into almost complete circles at the ends. It landed him somewhere between Wyatt Earp and Steampunk Hipster, which was a little unsettling on a Bigfoot. If he started wearing wire-rimmed glasses and a bowler hat, we were going to have a talk, assuming his wife didn't beat me to it. Nice stash, I said teasing. Good thing you got a raise. The cost of the wax alone probably eats up most of it. He scowled and twirled the facial hair in question. Like I told Jolene, keep it up and I'll start doing my eyebrows too. He puffed up his chest. I'm the man of the house and I'll wear my mustache any way I want. Jolene was his wife and a good southern girl in all ways. I highly doubted he told her that, at least in that tone. If he had, his eyebrows would be waxed, but not quite in the way he intended. I gave him my best sassy smile. Just in case she didn't hear you, I'll tell her you said that. He held his hands out, palms showing. No need for that. I'm sure she heard me just fine. Winking at him, I said, that's what I thought. I scooped the drinks onto my tray and headed down to greet my guests. Oh, thank Poseidon. Amber said as she reached for her coconut rum and pineapple juice. If ever there was a time I needed a drink, it's today. Dex gave her a playful smile. You love Mama, and you know it. Amber mumbled something around her straw that sounded like, Yeah, love to feed her to a great white if it even eat her. Dex gave her a squeeze. She'll be gone before you know it. Then we won't have to deal with her for another year. Amber rolled her eyes as she popped the cherry from her drink in her mouth. Yeah, it already feels like she's been here for a year, and the year she'll be gone will fly. She sucked down half her drink. So what's new with you, Destiny? Same old, same old, I said, propping my tray on my hip and enjoying the feel of the cool seawater flowing through my water shoes. Just another day in paradise. A few playboy fairies here, a drunken leprechaun there. Speaking of, somebody said they saw Stan firing off arrows down at a human-assisted living facility. Is he drinking again? Dax asked. I grinned. Stan was a Cupid who'd spent a few weeks here during an existential crisis caused by divorce rates, and we'd given him some suggestions for finding folks looking for lasting relationships. Mature people were less likely to divorce than young folks hooking up in bars, so we'd pointed him toward then. No, he's not drinking again, I said. He just made an adjustment to his target demographic. Ah, Amber plucked the pineapple garnish off her glass and bit into it. That makes more sense. I was worried for a minute. Throwing a drunken Cupid into a place with readily available Viagra, older model fake boobs, and dementia has hot mess written all over it. I couldn't help but laugh at the image. True story, but no, stand sober, happy, and doing a great job as far as we've heard. Tempest, who was curled up in front of a fan behind the bar courtesy of Bob, called me through our link. Quit dawdling, you're needed up here. I turned to look toward the tiki. A group of gnomes had settled at one table and three leprechauns were at another. Ugh, gnomes were great, but leprechauns tended to be handsy. I gotta run. I said, feeling like my shift had just gotten ten hours longer. Amber glanced toward the bar and almost choked on her drink when she saw the leprechauns jump up on the table. I glowered at her. I'm glad you're amused. Maybe I'll suggest they join you down here. The water's great. She drew her dark eyebrows down at me and splashed me a little with her fin. Don't you dare. I'm here to escape insanity, not get sucked into more of it. She shot a sideways glance at Dax. Besides, his last experience with leprechauns didn't go so well. 
did it, honey. Dax blushed a nice shade of scarlet that matched his fin. No, they beat the pants off me at poker. Literally. I had to walk from the casino in the main building all the way to the shore in my undershorts. I barked out a laugh. Dax didn't often choose to walk on land because he hated pants, so it was funny that on one of those rare occasions, he lost them. That's what you get for gambling with leprechauns. Okay, I'll check back on y'all in a bit. I'd just stepped off the end of the water bar and back onto the pavers when somebody started yelling at the end of the beach. I looked down, and one of the fairies, Dane, I think they'd called him, was chest to chest with a blonde man I didn't recognize. The guy was definitely not there to surf. His khakis were crisp, and his white dress shirt was rolled up at the sleeves. Dane pushed him, and he pushed back. Cedric was in the water, but Kaylin and Evan dropped their boards and rushed over to break it up. I whispered an eavesdropping spell, but by the time it kicked in, all I heard was the older guy say, You've been warned. That wasn't helpful at all. He stomped back toward the resort, and I didn't give it a second thought after that. Fairies were known to be hotheads, so it wasn't exactly outside the norm. The gnomes were, as expected, great. I felt bad for them because they got a bad rap due to the whole yard statue thing, but in truth, if you were lucky enough to have a real gnome in your garden, you'd have the best yard in the neighborhood and a feeling of peace and happiness every time you walked through it. Unfortunately, the gnome liberation movement had sent most of them into the forests, but the upside was that they had much more free time. We nearly always had a group or two on vacation, and we also had a crew who worked at the resort maintaining the grounds. The leprechauns, unfortunately, also behaved as expected. I finally threatened to tie them to their chairs if they accidentally brushed up against me again when I delivered their drinks or food. I also made sure to add the tip to the check, otherwise they'd have stiffed me because they're so cheap. I ended up having to work a double with no help because the afternoon server, a new girl named Lola, called in sick. Luckily, it was just busy enough that the time passed quickly, but not so busy that I was run ragged. A group of elves hung out at the pool all day, so between a busy water bar and stepping down onto the shelf of the pool to hand them their drinks, I got to cool my feet off. Being so close to the ocean kept my magic on full charge all the time, and one of the perks of working at a magical resort was that I could use it as I saw fit to do my job. Clearing a table or mopping up a mess with a flick of a wrist went a long way toward lightening the load. Considering it was slammed all day and I had no other help, I was grateful for my gifts. After what felt like days, my shift finally ended. I sighed and plopped onto a bar stool, then kicked off my Crocs and stretched my feet. Wow, what a day! You're telling me, Bob said, pulling the cash drawer from the register and joining me. After just taking a few minutes to breathe, I had a giant glass of lime water while Bob and I counted the money and made the drop. Dang it! I grumbled, noticing a full trash can I'd missed. Bob glanced where I was looking as he wiped down the bar. You get that, and I'll finish up here. He blew his mustache out of the way. The wax had given up the ghost several hours before, and now it looked more like a giant red overcooked noodle rather than a handlebar. I did everything I could not to laugh when he shot me a dirty look. I slid off the stool and pointed toward the can, then levitated the whole thing off the ground. I didn't want to have the bottom rip out of the bag halfway between there and the dumpster, which was located behind the hut near the unicorn rest area. I was so focused on keeping the can from tipping that I didn't see the lump on the path in front of me, and my toe caught it, sending me ass over tea kettle. The garbage can crashed to the ground in front of me, and I flipped over to see what I'd tripped on. Dane's sightless amber eyes were forever focused on a spot somewhere behind me, his face relaxed in death. If not for the eyes, I might have thought he'd passed out on his way to the hotel. Well, aside from the dagger sticking out of his back... Chapter 4 
Call me a wimp, but I scream like a little girl and move backwards on my hands faster than any crab could have ever done. Poor Bob bolted around the corner, and I was afraid he was going to fall over the body himself. Stop! I yelled, holding out my hands. I'd already fallen over a dead body. I didn't need a Bigfoot landing on me on top of it. That would just be the cherry on top of the sundae. He skidded to a halt, slinging sand onto the body and over it onto my feet. Bob looked down as his eyes adjusted to what little light there was between the moonlight and the dim bulb on the back of the building and let out a yell that sounded sort of like Chewbacca with his hand caught in a ringer washer. I didn't feel so bad about my less-than-dignified squeals at that point, but that was a passing thought. Is that the fairy from earlier? He asked, walking a wide path around the body. Yeah, Dane, they called him. I replied, my voice shaking. Bob held out a hand to help me up and nearly threw me over his shoulder when I took it. Sorry, he said, his hand shaking. He never took his eyes off the body. I brushed the sand off my clothes and tried to gather my wits. The dagger was a fancy one, and if I was any sort of judge, old. The watery light spilling from a single bulb on the back of the tiki glinted off the silver peeking from the edges of a leather-wrapped hilt and shone against a blood-red stone set into the pommel. I stepped closer and bent down to get a better look. Bob pulled me back, shaking his head. Don't get too close. There may be other evidence you can't see. You need to call Blake. Tempest scurried around the corner late to the party. Where have you been? I snapped, scowling at her. I thought you saw a snake or one of those giant toads, she said. The panic in your mind was similar. Then Bob yelled and neither one of you came back, so I figured I'd better check. Thanks for having my back. I replied, mustering as much sarcasm as I could. I'm going to go get Blake. She raised a brow and looked at Bob, pointing to him with her snout. I followed her gaze. He didn't look so great. I'll go get Blake. A frown line creased the fur between her eyes. You two keep an eye on the body. Do I have to? Bob asked, fighting his gag reflex. I rolled my eyes despite the gravity of the situation. If you barf, I'm going to punch you. I had a stomach of steel and could eat spaghetti while watching even the goriest of horror movies, mostly because I thought they were stupid, but my belly drew the line at vomiting. A small pop sounded as Tempest disappeared, then again when she reappeared less than 20 seconds later with Blake, who sucked in a breath as he took in the scene. I started to conjure a light ball, but he shook his head. We don't need the attention. Leave it out while I contact the council. But first, tell me everything that happened. A few seconds later, he uttered a spell that I recognized as the one that locked down the resort. Nobody could come or go, no matter how powerful they were. Shaking his head, he said, When we built those into the resort's security system, I didn't think I'd ever need them. Yet here I am, using them for the third time, he said. I held my hands out, palms up. I was just taking out the trash and literally fell over him. Blake heaved a sigh and glanced between me and Bob, who was making an effort to look anywhere but at the body. Anybody who thinks Bigfoot's more scared of you than you are of him is probably right, unless you're messing with his friends or family. But this situation involved neither. Did either of you see anything? What time did the last guest leave, and who was it? Bob shook his head. It's been a normal night, quiet even, once the leprechauns left. The last folks to leave were the gnomes, and that was a couple hours ago. The dagger was buried to the hilt at what looked to be a downward angle and probably weighed at least a couple of pounds, so it was safe to say the gnomes were in the clear. They did have magic, But another part of the resort security was that Blake and I were the only people able to use magic against another person. Oh, and Margot, the sphinx who stood watch over the entrance to the main resort had carte blanche. So yeah, the gnomes were in the clear. That did, however, leave it open to anybody who had the height and strength to commit murder the old-fashioned way. Did the gnomes come up the path? 
Now that you mention it, yeah, they did, I said. So the body must not have been there when they left. Blake pursed his lips and crossed his arms, resting his chin on one hand while he scanned the scene for any signs of clues. There were none to be found, or at least none that were screaming, Look at me, I'll tell you who done it. Once that was clear, he pulled his cell from the back pocket of his jeans and he scrolled through his contacts, then put it to his ear. Since he turned his back to us and walked away for some privacy, I had no choice but to mumble a spell that allowed me to overhear what he was saying. Lucy? He said when a woman answered. Ah, Lucy Flanders, the president of the board of directors for Enchanted Coast Corp. Blake? It's almost one in the morning. What's going on? Yeah, sorry to call so late, but we have a huge problem. Dana Farrell has been murdered. Destiny just found him behind the tiki when she was taking the garbage out. Stabbed. Bob started to say something, but I put my fingers to my lips and tilted my head sideways. Dawning crossed his face when he realized what I was doing. As a Bigfoot, he had preternaturally good hearing anyway, so he joined me in shamelessly listening in on the conversation. Crimes were handled a lot differently on the resort, and in magical communities in general, than they were in the human world. We had our own justice system and our own investigators. As a matter of fact, a lot of the ace investigators on human law enforcement teams had at least a touch of magic. Dane O'Farrell? She hissed, panic creeping into her voice. Do you have any idea what this means? I glanced at Bob, who just shrugged. Yeah. Blake said, sighing. I know exactly what it means. Well then, please, I thought, waiting impatiently while he paused. Do tell already. It means we're going to have the weight of the fairy kingdom crashing down on us like a ton of bricks when they find out one of their princes has been murdered on our property. Oh, crap. I mouthed to Bob, whose brows about shot off the top of his head. Just my luck. First, an angel's murdered on my shift, now a fairy prince. At least this time, I wasn't a suspect. I hoped... Chapter 5 Can we go now? I asked once he was off the phone. Blake snorted. Are you out of your mind? No. You're the one who found the body. What about me? Asked Bob. Jolene's waiting for me, and she'll be worried. Blake shot him a, don't BS me look. I know as well as you do that Jolene is already in bed. Still. He turned to Tempest. Would you mind popping over and letting her know what's going on? My little fox flipped her fluffy tail and narrowed her luminous sapphire eyes at him. It would have looked a little adorable to anyone who didn't know her, but she was peeved and worried. You won't let them do anything to Destiny if they get here before I'm back? Blake threw up his hands. You're going to be gone all of 20 seconds. And besides, why would you think I'd let them do anything to Destiny? She studied him for another second, then popped out. Despite his 20 seconds guess, she was gone for several minutes. We were already seated at the bar when she reappeared. Sorry it took me so long. Jolene was worried. Yeah. Blake said, sipping on his soda. Me too. He'd asked us about every guest that had come and gone that day. The only person I could think of who was out of place was the guy who'd shoved him earlier. Was he a fairy, too? Blake asked when I mentioned the shove. I thought about it for a second. Honestly, I couldn't say. They were so far away, all I could see was what he was wearing, not his ears or eyes. I paused, unwilling to be dragged into the middle of a royal fairy mess. Blake knew me well enough that he noticed. Spill it, McGanty, he said. It made my heart ache a little because he'd call me by my last name when we were a couple and goofing around. This time, he wasn't kidding, though. I pulled in a breath. In for a penny. I overheard him tell Dane that he'd been warned after the brothers got in between the shoving match. I put the words in air quotes. Those were his exact words? Yep, I said, half regretting getting involved already. 
I hadn't told them anything the brothers wouldn't have, but now I was sucked in, hook, line, and sinker. Until the case was solved, I'd be answering the same questions over and over to a bunch of entitled asshats with enough money and magic at hand to destroy me if they didn't like what I had to say. Lovely. My ears popped and Lucy appeared at the end of the bar. Gone was the smiling, fun-loving woman I'd spent time with a couple of months before. In her place was a businesswoman, dressed to the nines in a crisp black suit, who was steel to the core. Two men in black-looking dudes popped in, too, one on either side of her. Where is he? She asked, her tone brusque. Bob motioned toward the path. Around the building. You can't miss him. Just ask Des. I shuddered at the memory of how he'd felt when my toes had first struck him. Solid, but with just a little give. Lucy gave him a wry look. I'll do my best. I've seen enough crime scenes that I think I can manage not to trip over the body. Frowning, I turned to Blake. I thought she was just the president of the resort. He shook his head. She does fill that role, but the three of us? He motioned to himself, then Bob and me. Do most of the heavy lifting. Her role comes into play when major decisions need to be made about the resort. Big ticket purchases, major security issues, public relations nightmares, that sort of thing. You know, like when princes get murdered. He rubbed a hand over his face. Her position as president of the board of directors is important, but her full-time job is as a lead investigator for the Council of Magic. Wow, that explained the comfort with dead bodies. Bob started to fill my water, but I shook my head. I'll have something stronger, please. It's turning into a beer kind of night. Blake agreed, and Bob poured all three of us a draft. While we waited for Lucy and her gorillas to do their thing, we sat in awkward silence and sipped. So where's Colin been? Blake asked, and I cringed. Colin was my werewolf... something. I'm not sure what. There was definitely an attraction there but we had a ways to go before I was going to call him my boyfriend. He's off on a job, I said. Trying a land dispute case up in Louisiana. Two covens are fighting over the same field, and he's trying to resolve it rather than watch them beat themselves out of a ton of money going through the human court system. He'll be down tomorrow or the next day, probably. I see, he said, his jaw clenching. I don't know why he kept bringing Colin up. I went out of my way not to rub Colin in his face, but that didn't mean I was going to stop seeing him. Blake had cheated on me with his secretary back when we were engaged. He'd only kissed her, but that had been enough for me to call off the wedding, though he'd felt terrible about it. He claimed he didn't know what had come over him, but I was wary about what he'd have occasion to feel terrible about once we were married and had broken it off. I'd met Colin a couple months back when he was at the resort on business. The fallen angel who had been serving penance by managing the tiki had gone and gotten himself poisoned, and Colin had been one of my own personal suspects until he'd saved my life. Since then, we'd been hanging out, just getting to know each other. There was mega attraction, but I'd already learned you couldn't base a relationship on just that, so we weren't in any hurry to speed things up. Ten minutes later, after more awkward silence poor Bob had done his best to fill, Lucy and her team strutted back around the corner of the tiki. She began grilling Bob and I about everybody who'd been there that day. We reviewed the pushing match and went over who all'd been there again. I got to the point that I was frustrated from answering the same questions over and over. I don't know what else we can tell you, I said, and Bob nodded and yawned. We've been here since before noon, he added. We've told you about every person that was here, every interaction, every comment the brothers made. There's nothing else to tell. Check the surveillance cameras. That was one of the few times in the almost four years I'd worked with him that he'd gotten snippy. But there was no doubt in anyone's mind that he was over it. 
It had been more than an hour since we'd found the body, and we were both bone-tired and had to do it again the next day. Except we'd be putting up with pissy people taking it out on us because they couldn't come and go as they pleased. Fine, then, Lucy said, then sighed. Sometimes I get a little myopic and tone deaf when I'm investigating and forget that other people have lives outside of the investigation. I'm sorry. You two go home and get some rest. That was more like the woman I'd met at a party we'd had not too long ago. A party that had been held in my honor, no less. I'd been awarded Employee of the Year and given a fat check and two tickets to the Angels Ball, which was coming up soon. Most of the fat check was still sitting in my savings account, but I'd gotten a heck of a deal on a smart TV and a gaming system on Prime Day. Tempest, who'd been curled up in front of her fan sleeping, yawned and hopped onto the bar. It's about time. I'm starving and want my bed. So what about the body? I asked. We can't just leave it there. Oh, she said, flapping a hand. We got rid of the body before we came back in here. Well then, that just gave me a whole new level of respect for her. Forget about her being my boss. Never piss off a woman who can get rid of a body in ten minutes flat without even messing up her nails. Chapter 6 It wasn't until I was halfway home that I realized I probably should have teleported. There was a killer on the loose after all. Something told me that murder was specific, though, so I kept moving. While I was going over things in my head for the hundredth time, I remembered the way the brothers had been teasing Dane that morning. They'd said something about a woman, and he'd replied it was just a flirtation. Now that I knew they were princes, I had to wonder if maybe that woman had read a little more into the relationship than Dane had. The wrath of a woman scorned and all that. Rather than risk being overheard, I spoke to Tempest through our link. Do you remember the brothers teasing Dane about a woman this morning? She was quiet for a few seconds. I wasn't paying much attention until I caught sight of a bird behind him. But yes, now that you mention it, they were teasing him about a leggy brunette, I believe. I remembered that the gist of the conversation was that he couldn't get serious. Tempest remembered before I did. He said the woman he married should at least have a pulse. So, a leggy brunette without a pulse. Oh, no. Marissa's form came back to me from the day before, along with her comment about handsome men, and one in particular. I bit my lip as I walked along the pathway toward my cottage. I considered myself a crazy good judge of character, and I couldn't see her as a murderer. She was here specifically to avoid that, in fact. The only way I could see her killing anybody was by accidental exsanguination if her bloodlust got the better of her. But my brain flipped back to Dane's not-so-kind comments. Through no fault of her own, she wasn't stable in her current state, and I had to consider whether or not she might have accidentally flipped her lid if Dane had rejected her because she was a vampire. Anything was possible, but I still didn't see it. Other than trying to adapt to life as a vampire, she seemed normal and even nice, somebody I'd probably be friends with. Lost in thought, I didn't even see the truck sitting in front of my cottage until I was almost on top of it. I grinned, and my heart gave a stupid little jump when Colin came out onto my porch. Holy cow, woman. It took you forever to make it that last hundred yards. Laughing, I said, how do you know? He cocked a brow. Werewolf hearing, remember? He crinkled his nose. And smelled. He leaned closer to me and took a deeper sniff, frowning. I pushed him away, still smiling. Quit it, weirdo. No, Colin said, narrowing his eyes, then holding me at arm's length to look me over. And not in a good way. I smelled death on you. When I heard the concern in his voice, I stopped struggling. Yeah, you do. But it's not me, so come inside and I'll tell you all about it. I want to get out of these clothes. He bent down to scratch Tempest behind her ears, and she butted him with her head, 
then walked underneath his hand so that she got a nice stroke all the way down the black stripe that marked her white fur from her ears to the tip of her tail. My phone dinged with an incoming text as we were stepping across the threshold. I pulled it out and was surprised to see a text from Blake telling me to take the next day off. As a matter of fact, Bob and I were both to stay home, and he suggested we leave the property altogether. Callum went to the fridge and pulled out a beer. I know you have to work tomorrow, but... Actually, I said, cutting him off and raising my phone. That's what that text was about. I'm now off tomorrow. Blake suggested we both take the day and go off resort. He wants us off the radar of the ferries until he can get a handle on things. He poured me a glass of wine and handed it to me, and I gave him a questioning look. I know I didn't ask if you wanted wine or a glass of tea, but I figured if you came home smelling like a dead fairy, you probably needed it whether you asked for it or not. You even know it was a fairy? I asked, then felt badly for calling poor Dane an it. He, I meant. Yeah, he replied. Just like most every creature, fairies have their own distinct scent, both as a species and individually. We made our way to the couch, and he took one end, then patted the spot beside him. Now how about you sit down and tell me why you smell like that? Let me change clothes first, I said, setting my glass down on the coffee table. Five minutes, he said. I'm dying to know. He realized what he'd said when I arched a brow at him. You know what I mean. No pun intended. I headed to my room and peeled off my clothes, giving my feet a good stretch when I pulled off my socks. I was going to have bunions by the time I was 35 at this rate. When I pulled the scrunchie out of my hair and ran my hands through it to shake out the tangles, it felt like heaven. I pulled on a pair of yoga pants and a t-shirt and padded back downstairs. Colin was flipping through the channels, but muted the TV when I plopped back down beside him. Tempest was curled up on her pillow on the other end of the couch and cracked a sleepy eye open when I sat back down. I felt a little pang of envy that she could drop off to sleep like that. I had a feeling my night wasn't going to be nearly so restful. So, tell me all about it, he said, draping his arm across the back of the couch behind me. I recounted the story, leaving out the part about Marissa. I wasn't sure what to do with that information yet. He mulled over all I'd said for a few minutes as I sipped my wine and reviewed the day's events in my head yet again. You're supposed to leave the resort for the day tomorrow, so how about we make a trip to Abaddon's Gate? I have a friend there who keeps a finger on the pulse of different politics, and he may be able to offer some insight. Abaddon's Gate was a city meant only for paranormals. It wasn't accessible to humans, so in addition to being a hub for gossip about the magical community, it also had a ton of great shopping opportunities of both the magical and mundane sorts. You could find fresh-baked bread and awesome restaurants sitting right beside shops that offered magical potions, herbs, talismans, books on spells and mystical lore, and even psychics and mediums. Real ones. Not the frauds you'd find in human communities operating out of a shop with a neon sign. I always wondered why. If they were psychic like they claimed, they could read every single person who walked into their shop and were always vague. Real psychics weren't like that. The universe had a strange way of disseminating information as it saw fit, not on demand. You're in grave danger or your luck is about to change were bunk. As far as I was concerned, those type of statements applied to everybody. It was all a matter of perspective. I could fall in the pool, hit my head and drown, so if I did that after a psychic told me it would happen, I'd have to say she was right. That didn't mean she saw it coming, though. On the flip side, the city had a dark underbelly, but all cities did. It was just like any other place on the planet. As long as you took appropriate precautions and didn't put yourself in stupid positions, you were fine. My cousin Myla, an earth witch, ran a holistic shop there and offered all sorts of beauty products, health aids, candles, and, of course, individual herbs. It had been a while since we'd visited, and her familiar calamity was Tempest's sister. 
It would be nice to catch up. Plus, I was almost out of sunscreen. That sounds like a fabulous idea, I said. I need some stuff anyway, and the last thing I want is some fairy knee breaker pounding down my door looking for information I don't have. Yeah, Colin said, a frown marring his face. I'm not keen on them finding you anyway, at least not until they've had a chance to calm down. The O'Farrells aren't just royalty, they're the royal family. They're going to be kicking every rock they can until they find who killed him. The thought wasn't comforting, but it didn't worry me too much. For one, I wasn't going to be home. For another, I hadn't done anything wrong. I said as much, and Colin sighed. Unfortunately, guilt or innocence isn't going to mean much to them. Under normal circumstances, they're fair people. But this isn't normal circumstances, and I don't want you in the line of fire if they're putting vengeance ahead of justice. You didn't do anything, but that doesn't mean they won't become... invasive to make sure you're telling everything you know. Fabulous. A daddy bear fairy whose boy had just been killed was willing to fly through my melon like a psychic sausage grinder rather than take my word for it. The idea of getting out of Dodge sounded better and better by the minute. Chapter 7 Callan had turned the TV to some cooking competition that I normally enjoyed, but I couldn't get my thoughts to settle. My mind flashed suddenly to Marissa. She'd mentioned a cute guy, and the brothers had teased Dane about a leggy brunette. The descriptions, though vague could apply. I wasn't even aware I was chewing my cuticle, a habit I had when I was thinking about something, until Colin lowered his arm from the back of the couch to tap me on the shoulder farthest from him. Spit it out, he said, turning down the volume and examining my face with narrowed eyes. I pulled my hand away and placed it on my lap, feigning nonchalance. When he didn't buy it, I pulled in a breath and huffed it out. Fine, I said, then told him about my suspicions. There are at least 20 vampires on this resort right now, he said. Since they were the only creatures besides zombies, yes, they're real, but human TV has it all wrong. Who lacked a pulse, narrowing down the list of creatures Dane could have been talking about wasn't exactly brain surgery. I'd already considered that. Yeah, but none that are either unattached in the right age range or fit the physical description. Yeah, but as far as the guy she was talking about, he was far from the only good-looking man here, he pointed out. Somebody knocked on my door, and I about jumped out of my skin. I had wards set around my property so nobody could just enter my space as they pleased. They were always in place, and the only other people who could cross through them by themselves were Colin and Blake. Plus, with Colin's wolf hearing, nobody should have been able to sneak up on us. Go to your room, Colin said, pushing from the couch in a fluid motion. He was quivering, and I knew he was preparing to change on the fly if necessary. I'm not, I said. At least not until I see who it is. He gave a sniff. It's a fairy, he said. You're good, but you're no match for one of them. No, but neither are you. We have a better chance together. He pushed in front of me as I walked to the door, and I was a little irritated by the caveman tactics. Rather than argue about it, though, I let him glance through the peephole. Destiny! A voice called from the other side of the door. It's Siri. Open up. It's critical. Siri was a young fairy who was a regular at the tiki bar. She came down at least once every couple of months, and we'd hung out a few times on my days off. Tempest had jumped from her place on her pillow and was peering around the edge of the curtain on the picture window. It's her, she said, nodding. I pulled the door open, and Siri shoved past me, pushing the door shut behind her. You need to leave, she said, grabbing my arm. Ian O'Farrell is on his way here, and trust me, you don't want to be here when he and his guard arrive. I'm amazed the brothers haven't already been here. He's hell-bent on getting to the bottom of this, as he should be, but he's not seeing reason. 
Give him a day or two to calm. But for now, you and Bob need to go. Let Blake deal with him. I gently pried her fingers from my arm, rubbing away the half moons left there by her fingernails. First, how did you get through my wards? I asked. If there was a loophole, now is a good time to know about them. For that matter, how did you get past the resort's wards? This place is locked down tight. She lowered her brows and scoffed. Please, yours are damned good, but not good enough to keep a fairy out if she, or he, is determined enough to get in. We use those level wards to hide ourselves as children when we're playing hide-and-seek. That was not comforting at all. As far as the resorts, she continued, we wouldn't have been able to breach those. We arrived this evening before he said them. I nodded. At least those were secure. So who's Ian O'Farrell, and why should I care if he's coming here? She pulled in an impatient breath. Ian O'Farrell is the king of fairy, and though he's usually known for keeping a calm head, he's gone beyond the point of reason. Rumors from home have him out for blood, and the queen's coming with him. Unlike the king, she's not known for keeping a cool head. She's demanding and entitled. Last time she went on a tear was when they were first married, and she caught wind that he'd been cheating. So was he? I asked, thinking how pissed I was just because Blake had kissed another woman. And we weren't even married yet. She lifted a shoulder. If he was, he was keeping it under wraps. It's common knowledge, though, that he was in love with another woman, a girl he'd grown up with, but his marriage was arranged when he was a babe. The concept was so archaic, I couldn't believe anybody still practiced it. There was still one problem. Bob has Jolene and the kids and they can't teleport, I said. And the whole resort's on lockdown. Nobody can come or go. She waved me off. Aiden, her boyfriend, is there now. He's getting them out, and I've already spoken with Blake. He's meeting us at the North Gate in ten minutes. I pulled in a deep breath. Siri wasn't prone to hysterics, and as a fairy, I trusted she had a better feel for things than I did. I wouldn't walk away from a fight, but I wasn't stupid either. She'd just walked right through some of the strongest magic I had. If she could, then I'd hate to see what a king could do. Okay, then, I said. We'd already planned to go to... She held up a hand. Don't tell me! Or Blake either, for that matter. If we don't know, we can't be compelled to tell. Just go. Colin's duffel was still sitting by the door, so I conjured a small bag for myself. Anything else I needed, Mila would have. He picked his up, and I took a second to reinforce my wards as best I could. Siri reached out for me, but I shook my head. Apparating with somebody else always made me sick. Poor Colin was turning green at just the idea, but he couldn't do much about it. He picked up his bag and took my hand as Tempest jumped onto my shoulder. I nodded at Siri, closed my eyes, and said the words. When I opened them, we were standing at the north gate alongside Siri, whose purple hair shone silver under the moonlight. Within a couple of minutes, Aiden arrived with Bob and one of the kids. Then they both went back for Jolene and the other two. Finally, Blake popped in and didn't waste any time, other than to scowl a bit at Colin, opening a small glowing hole in the invisible barrier. Without a word, Bob and Pham stepped through, and Colin, Tempest, and I followed. The door sealed shut behind us with a sizzle, and all we could see when we looked back was a solid cliff. That's how it was meant to be in order to keep out unsuspecting humans. Now we were off grounds and could go wherever we needed to. I turned to Bob and Jolene, who looked worried and had the kids pulled tight against them. Where do you guys want to go? Jolene worried her lip for a minute. Where are you going? Abaddon's Gate, and I think it'd be a good place for you to go to, too. Bob and Jolene glanced at each other and nodded. The kids whooped with delight. The gate offered all kinds of goodies for kids. Candy shops, magic stores, and shows, flying carpet rides, you name it. Plus, there would likely be other Bigfoot families there, too. There always were, 
and that would make it easier for them to blend in. I didn't like the idea of my friends being vulnerable. You have the cash for a hotel, or have you spent it all on mustache wax? I asked, trying to relieve the tension. It worked, because Jolene laughed, and Bob glowered at me. Ha ha, he said. We're good. You girls spend a ton on hair goop, nail stuff, and skin creams, yet a little tin or two of mustache wax is cause for bankruptcy. Jolene snorted. A tin or two a week, you mean? Colin slapped him on the back as he examined the results of said wax. Bob's stash was back in fine form, so he'd obviously worked on it since he'd gotten home. It looks great, he said. Ignore them. They don't get the relationship between a man and his facial hair. Colin himself liked the scruffy look. Siri's sense of urgency had rubbed off on me, and I was anxious to get away from the resort. Okay, I said. We can debate men's facial fashion when we get there, but we need to go. There was a portal that opened straight into Abaddon's gate just a few yards away, and I started moving us in that direction. Once through the portal, Jolene gave me a hug. We have some family I've been wanting to visit anyway, so that's where we'll be. You take care and call if you hear anything or need anything. You hear? I hugged her back. Same here. I'll give y'all a call tomorrow evening. We watched them lumber down the sidewalk, people clearing way for them as they went. Stupid fairy went and got himself killed on our watch, and we were the ones who had to wait out daddy's temper and mama's wrath. What a pain. Turns out the universe had things under control, though. Chapter 8 Rather than wake Mila in the middle of the night, we decided to get a hotel room at the Dusty Dragon. Despite its name, it was a cute B&B-style place, except it was in the middle of town. The beds were comfortable, and the owner, a cheerful brownie named Ingrid, answered the door within just a couple of minutes, despite the late hour. Destiny, come in, she said, smiling and opening the door wide. You're in luck. We only have one room left, and from the looks of you, you need it. I'd known her from when she used to work at a coffee shop across from Myla's store, and she'd always been good-natured and generous. Tempest yawned from her place on my shoulder, and Ingrid's face went soft. Aw, little one, you look tuckered out. Are you hungry? No matter how tired Tempest might have been, she was never too tired to eat. She jumped from my shoulder to the floor and looked up at Ingrid, using those luminous blue eyes and her overall cuteness to her advantage. Ingrid clucked her tongue. Don't go using that innocent expression on me. Old Ingrid may be soft, but she's not dumb. You're a fox, and I'll not be forgetting that any time soon. Though she was trying to be stern, she failed miserably. Come on, then. We'll find you some scraps. Ingrid glanced up at us. The bedroom's the last on the right, upstairs by the bathroom. Go put your bags away, and I'll fix you sandwiches, too. My stomach rumbled. I hadn't eaten anything since a quick grilled cheese at lunch, and one of Ingrid's famous sandwiches would be fantastic. She always used just the right meat to toppings to bread ratio. By the time we were settled for the night, it was almost three, and when we woke, the sun was cutting through the lacy curtains at an angle that told me we'd slept late. Tempest was curled upon the pillows between Colin and I, and both of them were still sleeping. I got up and went through the morning routine, trying to be as quiet as possible. I shouldn't have bothered. With Colin's werewolf hearing and instincts, I'd barely made it to the bathroom before he was awake. Tempest, on the other hand, was still snoring. The smell of frying bacon was enough to tease her awake, though. We dressed and went downstairs to find Ingrid hard at work in the kitchen. She smiled when I poked my head in the door. Come in, she said, motioning to the huge Eden family kitchen. 
I heard you moving around and started brunch. The other guests told me in advance they were going out for breakfast this morning, so it worked out in your favor. She winked. Isn't often I get to sleep in a little these days, so I'll take it. There was already a selection of fresh muffins and fruit on the sideboard, and cinnamon rolls were cooling on the counter. I plucked a strawberry muffin from a basket, then poured a couple cups of coffee, handing one to Colin. Ingrid always had been a good cook, and I'd been glad to see her get the B&B. She deserved it. Good Lord, I exclaimed, realizing how much food there was. You're cooking enough food for an army, she laughed. My other guests are werebears. They'll want snacks when they get home, and the muffins will be fine for tomorrow morning. She glanced up from stirring pancake batter as I bit into a muffin. How is it? I groaned and chased it with a sip of coffee. Amazing, as always. Colin had gotten his own, and we took seats at the table. After Ingrid poured a few pools of batter onto the griddle and pulled the bacon from the oven, she turned to us. So, I hear there was some excitement at the resort last night. I didn't want to grill you last night because you were worn to the bone. But you're fine and dandy now. Let's hear it. She raised a brow and crossed her arms. There's not much to tell, I said, wondering what she'd heard. I tripped over a body when I was taking the trash to the dumpster last night. That's part of what's going around. Wait. I paused, with my muffin halfway to my mouth. It's going around already? I don't know why I was surprised. She huffed a sardonic breath out through her nose. Course everybody knows. A fairy prince takes a knife to the back at the most popular paranormal vacation destination on the planet? That's pretty big news. Plus, if you remember, my sister works in housekeeping there. I'd forgotten about that. Word was probably all over by that point. What else have you heard? Colin asked, peeling a banana. I heard the prince wasn't exactly on good terms with a certain member of the bride's family, and that they're tearing that resort apart to find whoever killed him. Ingrid glanced over her shoulder at us as she turned to flip the pancakes. They're not happy you left, either. I lifted a shoulder as I reached for some bacon. I don't figure they are, but I wasn't sticking around so an office rocker king could pilfer through my melon either. I don't blame him for feeling that way, but I'm not going to be within easy reach until he gets a handle on himself and comes to his senses either. I feel bad for Blake, Colin said, slathering some butter on another muffin. I bet he hasn't slept a wink since last night. He was probably right, and a twinge of guilt twisted through me as I thought of the good night's rest I'd just gotten. I'm surprised I slept so well, not so much as a whisper of a bad dream or insomnia just hours after I trip over a dead body. I'd barely gotten the sentence out when it occurred to me that it had been too good. I cast Ingrid a sideways glance, brow raised. She returned my gaze without shame. That'd be because I slipped some of my grandmammy's sleep elixir in your tea last night. You roofied me? I asked, my voice an octave higher than usual. She waved her spatula at me, her dark brow creased in consternation. Don't get your knickers in a wad. You looked a mess when you got here, black circles under your eyes and about to fall over from exhaustion. Course I roofied you. I sighed. She'd mothered me since I first met her right after I moved here from Georgia. Myla, too. She didn't have any kids of her own, so she'd adopted us. Grumbling wouldn't do any good, and truth be told, she'd done me a favor. That's okay, I guess, I said, unwilling to go as far as thanking her for drugging me. You're welcome, she replied, despite my lack of gratitude, as she pulled the rest of the bacon out of the oven. We played the who might have murdered the prince game for a few more minutes, but when Ingrid slid the pancakes and fresh berry syrup in front of me, I was done talking. When Tempest reached for her sixth piece of bacon, I swatted at her paw. 
Have some berries, I said. All that grease is going to make you sick to your stomach, and it's bad for you. Ingrid snorted. I'm almost 300 years old and have eaten bacon nearly every day of it. I'm not dead yet, so I dispute that theory. Being from Georgia, I couldn't argue, if for no other reason than it would have been sacrilege. I sighed and motioned to the plate, deciding debating the health deficits of bacon wasn't the hill I wanted to die on. Chapter 9 I headed over to Mila's after we ate breakfast, and Colin went to talk to a few friends to see if he could find out anything. The tiny bell above her door was spelled to induce a feeling of happiness, just a little dose, and it hit me as soon as I walked through the door. It was one of her more clever charms. She said it made her feel good to make others happy, and it also took some of the meanness out of those prone to it, so it was a win for her when it came to customers with a tendency to be difficult. They were happy, she was happy. Win-win. She squealed and rushed forward to pull me into a hug when she looked up from a candle display she was putting together. I didn't know you were coming, she said, shoving me back to look me over like she hadn't seen me in years rather than weeks. I didn't know I was coming either. Where's Calamity? Tempest raised her nose to the air, sniffing, not caring that she was interrupting. She and Calamity were close, and she missed spending time with her. She's upstairs. The door's cracked, so go on up. The words were barely out of Myla's mouth before Tempest bolted up the steps toward the loft apartment Myla had above the shop. After she was gone, I explained what was going on. Myla finished arranging the candles, then leaned her hip against the counter as I told her the story. Oh, I heard about that, but had no idea you were the one who found him. They must be keeping that under wraps. Of course, I'm sort of isolated here until I close up shop, so I only hear what people tell me when they pop in. Yeah, it wasn't the best way to close out the night. I said, shuddering when a vision of Dane's lifeless eyes drifted through my brain. And worse yet, I'm afraid a girl I met is going to be caught up in it. I took a seat on the stool behind her counter and told her about Marissa. Myla scrunched up her forehead. That's kind of a leap. I mean, surely there were other vampires there that matched that description. Yeah, maybe. I sighed and shook my head. But she was with the victim the night before, and the fairies aren't exactly taking the time to do an in-depth investigation. They're out for blood. Marissa seems sweet, and she doesn't have anybody in her corner. And she's had enough crappy things happen to her already. I hate to see one more added to her plate. Don't borrow trouble, especially when you have enough of your own, Myla said, concern etched on her face. Come and let me show you what I've been working on. You're going to love it, especially considering you work in the sun. I followed Myla to the back of the shop where she made her lotions, soaps, and other goodies. She handed me a white tube without a label. Smell it, she urged, her eyes alight. Unscrewing the cap, I took a whiff. It smelled like peppermints and coconut and something else I couldn't quite put my finger on. Something green and fresh. What is it? I asked, taking another whiff. It's a cooling cream she said. I made it with you in mind, but I got the idea when Mama sent me a Japanese mint plant for my birthday. It has mint and aloe for a cooling sensation, and coconut oil, ginseng, and golden serpent fern to help avoid sunburn. The coconut oil helps keep your skin moist, too, so bonus. I pinched my lips together, raised my brows, and nodded. Not bad, cuz. Try it. She said, so I rubbed a little on the back of my hand. It did feel cool, likely because of the menthol in the mint, but it was nice. Most of the time, the fern, ginseng, and mint are used in teas, so I made you a blend too, but I figured I'd make a cream so you could experiment. If nothing else, it smells good, feels cool, and will keep you moisturized. 
I grinned, rubbing some more on my hands. Thanks. I'll let you know how it works. Sorry I didn't bring you anything this time, but I had no idea I was coming. She loved the beach, but rarely got to go, so I tried to bring her something every time I visited. The last time, I'd spelled twin shells and made necklaces so that if she touched hers, I'd know she was thinking of me and vice versa. That's fine. Just seeing you is enough. Mila led me back through the shop and showed me some of her new products. She was always tinkering with spells and herbs to come up with new things, and her imagination seemed endless. I helped her make a new batch of mood lotions and enjoyed brushing up on my herbology. I wasn't much good at it because I was a water witch rather than an earth witch, but it was always good information to have. We added the ingredients from her recipes. She stirred the pot and added her magic. Then we bottled them up. After what seemed no time at all, Colin popped through the door, and I glanced up, smiling. Mila stepped forward and held out her hand. You must be Colin. Destiny's told me about you, and it's a pleasure to finally meet you in the flesh. Smiling, he took her hand. The pleasure's mine. He took a deep breath. This place smells amazing. I could smell it halfway down the block. Usually, herbal shops smell like old incense to me, but not yours. It helped that her shop was well lit and decorated in light summery colors too. I'd been in a ton of shops just like he was describing, and when Mila had decided to go this route, she'd been determined to make it light and happy versus dark and dreary. I was sure it was one of the reasons she attracted so much traffic. Her products sold themselves, but the appearance and atmosphere got them in the door. Thanks, she said. I didn't want people to mistake the place for some phony psychic shop. When I bought it, everything was dark wood, purple velvet, and black paint. She shuddered. Just no. So I said, "Did you learn anything?" Colin held out his hand and wobbled it side to side. A little, but not as much as I'd like. Everybody I talked to said Dane was a straight shooter. He didn't gamble, drink too much, or chase women. No wild parties, or at least not many. And everybody seemed to love him. That sounds too good to be true, I said. Not really, Mila replied thoughtfully. People would say the same thing about you or me, and they'd be right. I tilted my head at her. I highly doubt that. I piss people off on a regular basis. My mouth has a mind of its own. That's just sass, though, Colin said. It actually makes you interesting. And better at your job. Huffing a breath through my nose, I said, "That's not what Cass would have said. Cass or Cassiel was the fallen angel I mentioned earlier. Before he got the heavenly boot, he was the angel of temperance, though he'd been really bad at his job. Thus, the penance he was serving managing the bar. He was a mean drunk, a loud mouth, and a bully." Cass was the last person to be handing out personality advice or judging anybody," Mila said. Colin nodded. Yeah, next to him, sandpaper was soft and cuddly. They weren't wrong, nor were they the only people to think so. Diana, a fallen angel, poisoned him just a few weeks back. Turns out he should have tried harder to be a good angel versus an embarrassment to the family. And try though I had, I couldn't find out what, if anything, had happened to her for killing him. But finding out he was a decent guy doesn't help us out. I said. I was hoping to learn that the dude had some sort of serious personality quirk. Just being a regular guy doesn't help us at all. Actually, Mila said, it just may. I mean. If he were a womanizing, thieving jerk, you'd have dozens of suspects. Now you just have to find one or two people who had a grudge, and you've probably got your killer. Yeah, or if it was his older brother who took a knife to the back rather than Dane, Colin said. 
My contact said he's well known for his exploits. I have no doubt we wouldn't have to scratch more than the surface to come up with a list of names as long as your arm of people who'd want to kill him, or at least beat the daylights out of him. Figures, I said, shaking my head. Nothing's ever that easy. Before we could discuss it more, the Foxy Sisters, as we like to call them, came strolling down the stairs, tails in the air. Colin did a double take. Calamity and Tempest looked strikingly similar with one exception. Calamity had one blue eye and one green eye. It was a little startling at first, but you got used to it. They had a third sister, Chaos, who lived with our cousin Cory. Like Calamity and Tempest, she was black and white, but had green eyes. Myla, Cory, and I could, of course, tell them apart from any angle, but others had a hard time if they weren't looking at them head on. Colin, meet Calamity, I said. Calamity, this is my friend, Colin. Pleased to meet you, Calamity, Colin said, his brow furrowing for just a second as he threw me a quick glance. You too, Colin, she replied. Calamity and Tempest exchanged a look, and Tempest raised a shoulder. See what I mean? Calamity nodded. You're dead on. It'll work itself out, though. I scowled at them, and Colin looked confused. Myla covered a laugh with a cough. What do you mean by that? I demanded. Calamity rolled her eyes. I mean exactly what I said. It'll work itself out. I knew she was referring to Colin and I, so I glowered as she ambled away, tail swishing. Nobody likes a smartass, you know, I called after her, hoping beyond reality that Colin hadn't figured it out, too. She just flicked her tail and kept walking. Sorry, Myla told Colin. She's got a mind of her own, but usually she's at least polite. She was polite. Tempest said, defending her sister. How was that not polite? Destiny's family. The rules are different. Technically, she had a point, and I'd given up on trying to figure them out years ago. Glancing at my phone, I realized it was already three o'clock. I still need to run to the grocery store and grab a couple things, I said to Myla. But do you want to meet us in an hour at the Cracked Cauldron for supper? She grinned. That sounds great. I haven't had one of their burgers in forever. I'd had my first experience at the Cracked Cauldron several weeks back when I was there with my brother Michael, trying to figure out who offed Cassiel. Have you talked to Michael lately? We should see if he can come, too, Mila said. I didn't get to see him last time he was around. Michael was my older brother, and he spent a lot of time in the gate. Colin nodded. That's actually not a bad idea. He might have more insight into what's going on. As an investigator for the Paranormal Criminal Investigation Bureau, my brother traded in information and other goods. He'd been a troublemaker when he was younger, but when his best friend was killed in an alley during one of their misadventures, it scared him straight. Thinking about it, I was a little surprised I hadn't heard from him already because there's no way he hadn't heard about the murder. I said as much. That is odd now that you mention it, Myla said, tilting her head. Oh, said Tempest, swishing her tail. Actually, it isn't. He's undercover and can't get away. And how exactly do you know that? Myla asked. Rocky popped in a bit ago while you two were in the kitchen making the lotions, Tempest replied. Rocky was Michael's wolf familiar. Geez, I said. Thanks for coming to get us. And when were you going to get around to telling us? We just did, they said together. Of course they did. We'll meet you at the cauldron in an hour, I told Myla, glaring at the two familiars. See you then, she said. Maybe we'll be having fox burgers instead. Don't laugh. I was seriously considering it. I pushed through the doors and felt the little tug of reality as we stepped outside the range of the happiness spell. Nothing too noticeable, unless you knew it was there. Colin drew his brows together. Did you feel that? 
I explained it to him, surprised and impressed he was that sensitive, and I explained how it worked as we made our way to the grocery store at the other end of the street. I adored the place. Unlike human grocery stores, they carried all of the regular stock, but also catered to just about every magical creature you could think of, divided by aisle for the most part. There were all the standard aisles, canned foods, frozen foods, personal hygiene, cereal, etc. But there were also specialty aisles that carried items like faux blood, elixirs to help new vampires and werewolves control the bloodlust, high SPF sunscreens, and pick-me-ups for tooth fairies and other creatures who had jobs that required high output in a limited time frame. The latter was a proprietary blend invented by elves, but nobody would admit it was for Santa Claus, mainly because his existence was a mystery. Rumor had it he was real despite the denial of the entire adult human population, but the elves who worked for him were locked in an airtight non-disclosure agreement. I grabbed some cereal and other items that, though available at the resort commissary, cost an arm and a leg if you bought them there. On a whim, I picked up a bottle of the bloodlust elixir from Marissa. I spent most of the time there irritated at Tempest for the whole Rocky and Michael situation. On the way to the cauldron, we passed in front of Chocolate, a specialty chocolate and coffee shop. They didn't have just any chocolate, though. Charlie, the chocolatier and coffee connoisseur who owned the shop, was an artist. He made the most heavenly creations on the planet. Look, Tempest said, sighing. I'm sorry I didn't come get you when Rocky showed up. It was right before we came downstairs and the whole introduction thing went down. And you were relaxed and having fun with Myla. I didn't want to jerk you back to reality when there really wasn't any point. If she were anybody else, I'd say she was apologizing because she wanted chocolate. And that was, without a doubt, part of it. But she didn't like strife any more than I did. I relented. Fine. I guess I get it, so thanks. So, she said, hopping from the ground where she'd been trotting along beside us onto a vendor's table and then onto my shoulder. Chocolate-covered bacon? As a female and a carnivore, it was the best of all worlds to her. And to me, too, for that matter. I smiled. Chocolate-covered bacon it is. Colin? He grinned his wolfiest smile. I'll never say no to bacon. I don't know why I even bothered to ask. Chapter 10 We had a small cup of espresso each while we picked out more chocolate than anybody should eat in a week. Thankfully, Charlie used bags spelled to keep the contents cold and intact, so I just stuffed them in my bottomless bag, knowing they'd be fine. And yes, I'd stolen the idea from Harry Potter. It was sheer genius on J.K. Rowling's part. Making the bag bottomless had been easy. Making it light enough to carry 50 pounds of goodies had taken me months to figure out. Street vendors lined the sidewalk selling all sorts of things from magical charms to knock-off watches. We stopped along the way to admire the goods on display, but didn't buy anything. For the most part, they were all the same from one visit to another, so unless you needed something specific, the novelty wore off after a couple trips. Before I knew it, it was time to make our way to the crack cauldron. By the name, you'd expect it to be dark and dingy, or at least I had the first time I'd gone there. I'd been wrong. I mean, it was nothing fancy, but it looked like just about any other sports pub in the U.S., or maybe the world. I wasn't exactly well-traveled, so I could only speak for the ones in the lower half of the eastern seaboard. It had a long wooden bar, lots of TVs, and a huge bear shifter bartender. Okay, maybe that last part isn't quite as common, but I'm willing to bet it's not as rare as you'd think, either. You just never know. Hey, Shane! I called to him as we claimed a high-top table near the bar. It wasn't quite late enough for the happy hour crowd to trickle in, so we pretty much had the place to ourselves, aside from a group of elves playing pool in the back. Well, if it isn't Destiny Magnetti and her pretty fox, he said, sauntering toward us. 
and Colin, if I'm not mistaken. You got it, Colin said, holding out his hand. They shook, and it was nice to see it wasn't one of those competitive shakes. How's your brother? He asked me, sliding menus in front of us. The first time I'd been there, I'd been looking for a safe place to hide because people were trying to kill me, or so I'd thought. Michael had sent me to the cauldron to wait on him and told me to ask for Shane. As a result, the burly bartender had taken me under his wing. I scooped up the menu, eager to see what they had other than burgers. Busy. He's working now, or else he'd be with us. My cousin Milo's joining us, though. Good, then, he replied, his voice booming in the near-empty space. What can I get you to drink? We ordered our drinks, and when he brought them, he paused. Listen, I usually make it a practice to listen rather than talk, but Michael's a friend of mine, and he asked me to look after you when you were here and he wasn't around. I leaned toward him. Okay, I appreciate that. Is there something I should know? He sighed and rubbed his jaw, scraping the whiskers. That's just the thing. I know the royal family, or at least I know about them. My wife's best friends with a woman who works in their household, and you know as well as I do, the help knows everything. That was a fact, regardless of what race you were. For some reason, folks of higher status tended to overlook people who worked for them, so there really wasn't any such thing as a secret in a place like that. So what's your take on it? I asked. He crossed his arms. If it were Dane's older brother, Evan, who got knifed to the back, I'd get it. For that matter, both Evan and Kaylin are rabble-rousers and have caused their share of hard feelings. Even their cousin Cedric has gotten into a scrape or two, but not Dane. He's one upstanding guy. He never hits on another man's woman, and I've never heard of him welching on a debt. He doesn't gamble or pick fights. The worst he ever did was drink a little too much sometimes. And even then, he either went quiet or was the life of the party. It just doesn't make sense. You're not the first one to say that, Colin replied, shaking his head and taking a sip of beer. It's true. Shane was thoughtful for a minute. The only person I can think of that Dane ever had a bone with was his brother's soon-to-be brother-in-law, though. Rumor has it, though, that Dane thought Thalia wasn't good enough for his brother and had petitioned his father to reconsider the marriage contract. Nobody knows that for sure, though, because Dane was a private guy and the serious responsible one of the group. Yeah, I said, thinking back to how he was the quietest one of the crew that day. I got the same vibe from him. So what do you know about Thalia? Maybe the bride-to-be didn't want to give up her freedom any more than Dane wanted his brother to give up his. Shane lifted a shoulder. The same stuff you always hear. She's young. I heard my wife and sister gossiping about how she had a secret boyfriend a while back, but that's not abnormal. She's young and pretty. I couldn't argue with that. Even though I worked 80 hours a week, I'd manage to find someone. If I were a princess, or whatever she was... I'd have lived it up, too. Or at least I like to think I would have. He wiped some crumbs from the edge of the bar. Anyway, I heard you were the one who found the body. When you came in, I figured you were in the gate until the heat died down some at the resort. You did the right thing. From what I hear, they have all the king's horses and all the king's men working on it. And though they won't go out of their way to start problems, they won't hesitate to do whatever they can to catch whoever did it. While he was talking, somebody else came in, and the sunlight from the open door flashed on something on the wall behind the bar. Looking around Shane's huge form, I realized he had an impressive knife and sword collection on display. I motioned to them and smiled. That's some brave art you have there, given this place must get pretty rowdy sometimes. He grinned. Those are so warded, an army of sober magicals couldn't get them off the wall, let alone a handful of drunk ones. So do you collect them? I asked, thinking of the dagger in Dane's back. One of the elves went out of his way to clear his throat and say how nice it would be to get some service. Passive-aggressive jerks. Shane held up his finger to me. 
Give me one second to get this guy his beer and I'll be right back. While he was gone, I pulled a pen and a small notepad out of my purse and sketched out the design on the dagger that had been in Dane's back as well as I could. Now, Shane said, swinging the end of the bar up and coming back to our table. To answer your question, yeah, I collect them. I've had a fascination with antique weaponry, knives and swords in particular, since I was a kid. Why? Colin slid the picture I'd drawn on the napkin around so he could see it. Does this look familiar to you at all? Shane sucked in a shocked breath, then picked the notepad up and examined it closer. It's more than familiar. I've seen it in person, and it's no wonder they're keeping the murder weapon a secret. What color was the stone in the pommel? Red, I replied. Why? That's a ceremonial dagger made by the dwarves when each of the fairy princes was born as offerings of peace, he said. Each of them had a different stone. The heirs, Evans, is a diamond, then Kellen's is a sapphire, and Dane's is a ruby. If your drawing is accurate, he was killed with his own knife. You could have knocked me over with a feather. Chapter 11 after we'd taken a few moments to absorb that information, Shane spoke, his expression thoughtful. I guess what you need to ask yourself is who's powerful enough to take a fairy's own dagger from him and kill him with it. That's no easy task. It took me a few seconds to recover because plausible scenarios were flashing through my head. Then I realized something. That can't be the way it played out. They were in board shorts all day, and that's what he was wearing when I found him. None of them were carrying daggers, so it wasn't taken off him. All they came to the tiki with were towels and surfboards. Shane chewed on his lip, thinking. That makes more sense. Dane was always the best fighter out of all of them, mostly because he was so level-headed. I can't think of a single man who could have taken it from him, even by surprise, but I suppose anything can happen. Colin had been quiet, his brow furrowed in thought. That begs the question, though. Where was the dagger, and who had access to it? Each room in the resort had a safe, and there was a main walk-in safe in a room off Blake's office that was warded to hell and back for items too large or too valuable to be left in a room. It was either in his suite or in the hotel security vault in Blake's office, I said, Assuming he didn't just leave it lying in the open in his room. For that matter, why bring it with him at all? Shane shook his head. He wouldn't have left it unguarded in his room. They carry them everywhere. They used to be used for warfare, which we all know isn't really a thing anymore, but they're still used in ceremonies and as proof of identification. If, for instance, they were on official business, they'd carry the knife to declare their status. Also... Dwarfs are odd when it comes to gifting. If the princes didn't carry them, it could be seen as an insult. Some species were so archaic and persnickety with their views. To be fair, though, witches had their own glitches when it came to propriety, so I couldn't say much without being a hypocrite, at least in theory. And I knew the fairies were sticklers for convention and had their own rules for that sort of thing, so it made more sense when he framed it like that. Colin rubbed his jaw. So if nothing else, it was just habit for them to carry them. Pretty much. Shame replied as Myla and Calamity pushed through the door at the same time as a group of elves. I've got to go, but I hope I helped. It's another piece of the puzzle, said Colin. So thanks. Myla already knew what she wanted, just like we did, so we gave him our orders so he could go take care of the elves. So the dagger used to kill him wasn't just any old knife, I told her as she plopped her purse up on the table. What made it so special, she asked. And why does it really matter? Does it tell you who killed him? Not really, but it was one of a kind, and I'm sure not just everybody had access to it. I took a sip of my beer. The reason it matters, Colin continued for me, is that was his own ceremonial dagger. Why are we worrying about the murder weapon or even the murder itself at all, she said. 
Isn't this something the resort, the ferry council, and the PCIB will take care of? I sighed. Yeah, but for some reason, I have a gut feeling I should follow along. Her face became serious, which is in our family, and in general for that matter, knew better than to ignore gut feelings. They were rarely wrong, and if they were, you probably weren't listening closely enough to them. Well, in that case, then, she said, you should probably move fast. From what I understand through the grapevine, once the fairy council has a solid suspect and enough evidence, they don't dilly-dally around. They take immediate action, and unless I'm sorely mistaken, the penalty for killing a prince is going to be death. Colin agreed. She's right. Once they have somebody, the council will give the PCIB a courtesy 24 hours or so to wrap things up on their end to their satisfaction. Then they'll take action. But note, I said courtesy. That's all it is. So, no pressure at all, then. Shame returned with Myla's beer and a refill for us, and it wasn't long after that our burgers arrived. I cut the one Calamity and Tempest were sharing in half and gave them each their own plates, then dug into mine. The cauldron's burgers were incredible, the kind that were so big you could hardly get your mouth around them, and the juices ran down your arms when you bit into them. They were massive, and the seasoning on the fresh-cut fries was to die for. Thank the gods for a high metabolism, or else I'd have been as big as a house. Myla, too, for that matter. I leaned back and patted my belly two-thirds of the way through. I couldn't eat another bite, and the half a beer in front of me seemed more like a gallon. I was full to the gills. You're not going to finish that? Colin asked, licking his fingers clean of the last bit of salt from his final fry. I waved my hand, switching plates with him without leaning forward. At that point, I don't think I could have bent in the middle if I'd had to. He scarfed the rest of my burger down, and I couldn't decide whether I was impressed or disgusted. Myla hit the wall with hers not long after I did, and Tempest and Calamity eyeballed it the same way Colin had mine. She cut it into two chunks and put one on each of their plates and divided her remaining fries amongst them. I'd stopped being surprised by their ability to eat their own weight in food a long time ago. After all the plates were licked clean, literally in Calamity and Tempest's cases, we took a few minutes to let our food settle. My phone chimed with a text, and I pulled it from my purse. It was from Blake. I swiped to read the whole thing, and my stomach, as full as it was, dropped to the floor. You and Bob can come home now, but if you're already settled, I've covered your shifts for tomorrow, so take your time. We found the murderer, a vampire named Marissa. Oh, no, I said as four sets of eyes swung toward me. What? Myla's expression was a combination of curiosity and concern. Now I know why I've had that gut feeling. They've gone and arrested the wrong person. I need to get back to the resort. Chapter 12 I texted Bob and Jolene to make sure Blake had contacted them, and he had. They wanted to stay another day to visit, since two days off in a row was so rare lately, but I had to get back. We didn't waste any time making tracks back to Ingrid's, and after a quick explanation, we gathered our bags from our room and paid up. I bought her a box of her favorite chocolate-covered strawberries as an apology for waking her up in the middle of the night, and she hugged me when we left. Don't stay away so long next time, she said with a sniffle. I miss you girls. Why don't you take at least a couple days off and come stay with me at the resort? I warmed to the idea as soon as I said it. You can relax and let somebody wait on you for a while. She smiled and smacked me playfully on the arm. I wouldn't know what to do with myself in a situation like that. Colin gave her a wry smile. Trust me, you'd figure it out. I don't know about that. She said, her leathery brown face crinkled into a smile. But I'd sure love to try. Tempest jumped onto my shoulder. I'll help you out. I'm a pro at it. I shifted my weight to accommodate her bulk. She's not lying. She's grown about as lazy as a cat. 
Tempest dug her claws into my neck, just enough to be irritating. A cat would never be able to keep up with you. I agree, I replied, holding back a snicker at her disdain. She was not a fan of cats, even though she acted like one most of the time. Ingrid stopped me with a hand on my arm. I know what you're heading back to, and I know you want to help this girl. But be careful with the king, and the queen too, for that matter, if she's there. Like with all royal families, things are more complicated than they'll admit to. I've heard rumors about everything from civil cover-ups to illegitimate children about that family, so watch your back. I gave her another squeeze and assured her I would. Since Callan had a full stomach and wanted to keep it that way, he convinced me to walk to the portal rather than teleport straight back. Tempest, on the other hand, opted to pop back to the resort to see if she could find anything out. She had her own clearance, so getting back into the resort wouldn't be an issue for her. After she left, I didn't let Colin burn any daylight, full stomach or not. With each passing minute, my dread increased, and it seemed like it took hours to get back to the resort. Once we were standing in front of the cliff mirage that hid the resort from humans, I pressed my finger onto what looked like a little rock on the side of the faux cliff to get us back into the resort. I was so worried I was too late to help Marissa that I was about to chuck my own burger. It took another ten minutes to walk back to my cottage. I stopped long enough to drop my stuff off, then headed straight to the resort to talk to Blake. Colin declared he was coming with me. I asked why. As an attorney, I want to make sure she's properly represented. Unless I miss my guess, they likely haven't explained the rules to her, and since she's newly turned, I'd be surprised if she knows them or even realizes she has rights. Are you up to apparating yet? I asked. He pulled in a deep breath, then released it. As bad as I hate to risk losing such an amazing burger, I suppose I need to be. I rolled my eyes. Look at it this way. If you lose the burger, you love the steak at the tiki, so you'll have room for one of them when we get things ironed out. His face lit up as he took my hand, and I couldn't help but laugh at him. Leave it to a werewolf to be willing to put himself through something that made him sick if there was a steak at the end of the stick rather than a carrot. That's a good way to look at it, he said. Lead on. I smiled. Try taking a deep breath. I've never had any problems, but other people say it helps. As soon as I heard him inhale, I closed my eyes and pictured Margot the Sphinx with her Greek goddess face and lion's body. When I opened them two seconds later, we were standing in front of the statue herself. Well, hello, Destiny. A smile curved her lips and she tilted her head forward to look at me. Sand showered down as she did so and I ducked my head to keep it out of my eyes. Sorry about that, she said. One of the disadvantages of living in a windy seaside place. By the expression on your face, I assume this isn't a social visit. I pressed my lips together. Unfortunately, no, it isn't, Margot. But how have you been? A frown marred her beautiful face. Not so good. The fairy king and I had a bit of a disagreement when I wouldn't let him pass with his full guard. You don't say, said Colin, interest covering the slightly green tint on his face. I was proud of him. Each time he teleported, he seemed to be getting better with it. Good, because when you lived in a place where the air was so thick with humidity that it felt like you were breathing water, walking was overrated sometimes. Yes, she replied. He showed up here with murder in his heart, and that's my raison d'etre, to stop those who would do harm to others from entering the hotel. I wouldn't let him pass until security came and disarmed him and his men. He blustered and threatened and acted like a child having a tantrum. It was quite the fiasco, but I'm afraid I had to insist. Despite my urgency, I had to smile at the image that put in my head. I'd never met the king, but by now, I didn't exactly have a favorable opinion of him. I realized it was unfair since he'd lost a son, but with the fear I'd suffered at just the threat of him, 
I was having a hard time finding my sympathy. Many people experienced heart-wrenching grief, but it was a poor leader indeed who allowed that grief to turn to unjustified violence. Just because a man was one of the most powerful beings on the planet, or even especially because of it, didn't mean he should use that power for vengeance rather than justice. That led to a curious thought. You said he threatened? What could he have done to you? I asked her. She gave a tinkling laugh that seemed out of sync with her looming form. Why, nothing at all. He's not even a millennium old, the silly fairy. I've existed for five that I'll admit to, she winked. Believe me, it'll take way more than threats from a being such as he to make me disregard my duties. I do love you, Marco, I told her, delighted again by her sass. I have to go find Blake because I'm nearly positive they've accused the wrong person, but I'll be back to hang out before too long. I miss you too. The view from there was incredible, and it wasn't by chance. When they'd built the resort, the hotel had been designed so that it sat up a bit and faced the gulf. Shimmering blue water led to the faraway horizon, and the sunset from there was one of the best on the Gulf Coast. Back when I'd been dating Blake, I'd often sit and watch the sunset with her while I waited for him to finish work, or we'd gaze at the stars while she told me stories about history I'd only read about in books, but that she'd lived through. She was an amazing creature and a good listener. Her advice, though not always what I wanted to hear, was usually spot on too. Destiny, she said as I started to dart past her. I froze and turned back toward her. Yes, Margo? I agree with you. I tried to tell them they have the wrong person, but they wouldn't listen to me. Come sit with me when you're done in there. I think we need to talk. And that was all I needed to hear. When a sphinx says it's time to chat, it's time to chat. Chapter 13 our shoes squeaked on the marble floors as we rushed through the grand foyer of the hotel. Flashing lights and the sound of cherry machines flowed from the casino to the left, while the smell of cooking food and the sounds of happy shoppers drifted from the restaurants and boutiques to the right. Finally, we reached the bank of elevators that led to Blake's office. I hadn't thought to text him before we left my place, and I wished I had. I hated to think we were wasting our time hunting for him when we needed to be laser-focused on finding Marissa. Using my finger on the biometric security pad that granted me access to Blake's level took longer than it should have because my hands were shaking so badly I couldn't hold still long enough for it to read. Finally, though, the doors whispered shut. Though I knew it was only a few seconds, it felt like it took hours for the elevator to climb all the way to the fourth floor of the five-story building. When the doors finally whooshed open at our stop, I bolted out of them and down the hall to his office where his secretary, not the same one he'd lip-locked, was manning a desk, pecking away on the keyboard in front of her. She looked up, startled, when I barreled through the doors and patted her hair. She was another perfect ten, just like his last one had been, from her perfect hair and teeth to the fancy acrylic manicured nails. A practiced smile sprang to her lips, and she opened her mouth to say something. I cut her off before she could. I need to see Blake, I said, not wasting any time. It's an emergency, please, and thank you, I added, cringing because I knew I'd catch more flies with honey than vinegar. It was a reality I often forgot. I'm sure you do, she said, her attitude condescending. I'll have to see if he's busy. The fake smile she gave me was about enough to make me want to snatch her from behind her desk. Rather than acting on my druthers, I reached across the desk and grabbed the phone myself, punching the button for the direct line to his office. It's me, I said as soon as he picked up. His tone was odd when he replied. That's lovely. Just tell them to leave it at the tiki for me, and I'll come get it as soon as I'm finished with my meeting. Thanks. He hung up, and I looked at the phone in my hand as if it were covered in alien goo. 
The secretary, on the other hand, didn't know whether to be terrified or indignant. Just for the fun of it, I growled and snapped my teeth, and her expression settled solidly on terrified. I turned to Colin and told him in a whisper what had happened. Then we go wait at the tiki, he said, turning to leave. It sounds like he wasn't alone and didn't want to say anything in front of whoever was in there with him. Giving the secretary one final glance, I turned on my charm and let a little more of my accent drip through than usual. No matter how many times I came to meetings with Blake, she hassled me every time I did, even though I'd never been anything other than polite to her. I was getting tired of it. I sure do appreciate your time, sweetie, and bless your heart, just look at those gorgeous nails. They're almost as good as if you paid to have them done in a salon. Her expression went from scared to seething in three seconds flat, though I wasn't impressed it took her that long. Any good Southern girl would have already been across the desk and had me by the hair. When I saw the confused look on Colin's face, I grinned, pushed my shoulders back, and walked out of the office with my head held high. What was that all about? He asked as we went back to the elevators. Why did you compliment her when she was so rude? And for that matter, what's up with her attitude to begin with? I waved him off as we stepped into the same one we'd just used. Don't worry about it. I was just teaching Miss Hot to Trot a lesson in hospitality. Now, I wonder who's in there that he didn't want us to run into. Probably the king, he said after the door slid shut. I'm sure. I can't think of any other reason he'd dodge us like that. Not when he was the one to tell us it was okay to come back. He also told you it was fine if you took another night, too, he pointed out. That was a valid point. Too late. I wondered if that had been a hint, then shrugged. Blake knew me well enough to know that I didn't do too well with hints. If he meant for me to stay away for another night, he should have said so. Not that I would have listened knowing Marissa's neck was on the line. I still wasn't sure what it was about her that made me so sure she was innocent, but I felt it in my gut. She was. Now I just needed to prove it. Chapter 14 We paused outside the hotel beside Margot. Back so soon? she asked. I thought you were going to talk to Blake about Marissa. We were, Colin said, but he was busy, gave us some cryptic message that we assume meant he'd meet us at the tiki when he was finished. She nodded. Then I assume you have a minute, and even if he's with the king and the king comes out and gets his hands on you like he's been demanding, I can take care of him. She snapped her jaws, much like I had at the secretary, then smiled. I climbed up on the base she was poised on and took a seat, then motioned for Colin to do the same. Thanks to all the walking, my feet were killing me. I kicked off my flip-flops and rolled my toes toward my shins, then pointed them out to stretch the cramps from my arches. So, I said once I was comfy, what is it you wanted to chat about, and why do you think Marissa is innocent? I'll answer your last question first. The girl came and went from the hotel numerous times, and all I ever saw in her heart was confusion. She feels like a lost soul. She even stopped and chatted with me once. That surprised me. Most people didn't realize Marco was anything other than a statue. They didn't realize she was actually a living sentry. I couldn't help it, she said. The first night she was here, she went for a stroll on the beach, then climbed up on my base and took a seat, just like you are now. She was talking to herself about what her future held, and the heartbreak she was feeling made me feel so sad for her that I just had to comfort her. I tilted my head, stuck on something she'd said. I thought vampires had no soul. Don't be silly, she said and I could imagine the consternation on her face. You should know better than that. Every living thing has a soul. It was actually one of the things she was lamenting, the loss of it. But vampires aren't alive, 
Colin said. Of course they are, my stony friend returned. They walk and talk and feel just like anybody else does and have just as wide a range of emotions and personalities as every other creature does too. Just because her heart doesn't beat doesn't mean she doesn't have a soul. Well, that clarified one common belief I'd always questioned, and it also made me feel better. I knew a lot of good vampires, and it had always bothered me that they might be lost once they passed. Anyway, Margot continued, I felt so badly for her that I just had to comfort her. We chatted for hours about her options, and I was pleased that she left feeling confident rather than defeated. So that's what convinced you she didn't kill Dane? Colin asked. More sand fell on us as Margot nodded. That, and I think I know who did. As I said, I'm stationed here because I can see into the hearts of man. The next night, the night before the murder, she passed with the young man Dane. They were happy and laughing, though his heart held a little longing along with the happiness. I found that odd, since he seemed to be exactly where he wanted to be and was obviously happy with his company. Margot paused to clear her throat. She came out later that night and talked to me. Apparently, they had a nice dinner and really hit it off. She commented that the suites princes could afford were much more luxurious than the regular hotel rooms, so I assumed that's where she'd been. For just a few minutes, that sense of loss that she's carried since she arrived was gone. So that's it? I asked, disappointed that she hadn't dropped some case-solving bomb that would clear Marissa beyond a shadow of a doubt. This information wouldn't do anything to help her at all, since I doubted the king would care one whit about the feelings detected by a sphinx. After all, he'd already ignored her once. Not to updump your apple cart, but the very next morning, the guys were at the tiki, and Dane's brothers were teasing him about finally finding a girl he may be interested in settling down with. He said he doubted that would happen, considering she didn't have a heartbeat. They didn't mention her by name, but from what you've said and what she told me, I have to assume they were talking about her. What if he told her that and she lost it and killed him? Stone groaned a little as she tilted her head to look down at me. Destiny! I'm surprised and disappointed. He was killed with his own dagger. An act of passion such as you're suggesting wouldn't have included that type of forethought. And I can promise you that when she came out that night, she had nothing but happiness in her heart. She was also wearing minuscule shorts and a tank top, so I doubt she could have hidden a dagger that size anywhere that wouldn't have been visible even if she did steal it. So that's what you meant when you said they wouldn't listen to you, Colin said. Yes, she replied, and when I glanced up at her, she was staring out at the sea, her face troubled. Blake did. But the fairy king said he wasn't taking the word of an old statue that claimed to be able to see emotions. Why, I wanted to chop him in half right then. But logic prevailed. Lucky for him. And for Blake, I said, my tone dry. It wouldn't do to have our sentry eat a fairy king. That wouldn't exactly be good for tourism. Colin barked out a laugh. Yeah, I can see the headlines now. His voice turned serious. Why do I get the feeling that's not the only reason you don't believe she did it? Because it isn't, she replied. One of the men the brothers were with, a blonde man, was seething with anger, though he did his best to put on a congenial front. I almost stopped him but thought better of it because he was just angry, not murderous. Still, he was dangerously close to the tipping point. I thought back to the shoving match. I know who you're talking about. 
They had a tussle down on the beach, and I heard him tell Dane he'd been warned. The dude's nose was seriously out of joint, but I got busy and didn't see where he went. For that matter, I didn't see any of them again because I got busy. They must have gone up to the hotel while I was down at the water bar or tending to the pool. We had a few bigger groups yesterday, and I was keeping my eyes on drinks rather than who was coming or going. I can tell you that the brothers came back up after surfing, but they were all laughing and having a good time, she said. I didn't even see Dane leave again, though that only means he must have left through one of the other doors. The resort had plenty of exits so that guests could get to other areas of the resort. We had tennis courts, parks for kids, benches set up so that couples could watch the sunset, and a few different restaurants and pool areas situated around the property. After a guest had initially passed the security entrances and successfully crossed past Margot before they checked in at the hotel, they were pretty much free to come and go as they pleased through any other exit. Different security measures were in place for people visiting the Tiki because we had a lot of water folk and people who came in on boats, but that was another story irrelevant to the topic at hand. So what about this man? Was he with them when they came back through after surfing? No, Margot replied, shaking her head and sending a few more specks of sand down on us. I didn't see him again. Well, that left us at exactly the same place we'd started, believing Marissa was innocent, but not being able to prove it. And the men who were convinced of her guilt had heard the same story and opted not to believe it, so it looked like we were going to clear her on our own. Chapter 15 Since Blake had said to meet him at the Tiki, we headed in that direction. I assumed Marissa was being kept under house arrest in her room since we didn't have holding cells, per se. I wished I could have teleported to her room, but everybody but Blake had to physically enter and leave the resort. I pulled off my shoes and enjoyed the feeling of the sand beneath my bare feet as we walked to the Tiki. Running my hand along the tops of the sea oats on either side of the path, as the sound of the ocean became more prominent, I realized again how much I enjoyed working there. The topic of the angel's ball flitted through my mind and decided now was as good a time as any to talk to him about it. Era Riel, the angel of water and a member of the Enchanted Coast Board of Directors, had awarded me two tickets to the prestigious event, and I wanted Colin to be my plus one. Our relationship so far was undefined, so I didn't want to just assume he wanted to go as my date. So, I said, drawing a deep breath, no time like the present. Remember those tickets Era Riel gave me to the Angel's Ball? He glanced down at me, and the sun caught his dark hair and formed an aura not unlike a halo. Maybe that was a sign. Yeah? What about them? I bit my lip. Well, I was wondering if you wanted to go with me. He raised his brows and cleared his throat. My face got hot, and I ran through ways to turn it into a joke when he said no. I just kind of assumed that was a given, he said instead. I'd already opened my mouth to offer some glib comment, though I had no idea what it would have been. Instead, I settled for, Oh, okay then. Good. I mean, I already had it marked on my calendar, he said, sounding a little unsure. Great, now I'd gone and thrown a monkey wrench into a situation that was apparently running along without a hitch. I did too, I said, groping for some sort of recovery. Assume you were going with me, I meant. I just wasn't sure if you did. He sighed. I know we're taking this whole thing slow, but maybe it's time to speed it up a little. At least, define it. I care about you. I'm not seeing anybody else, and I'm not interested in doing so. I tried to keep the ridiculous grin off my face, but failed for sure. Same here. So does this mean we're exclusive? Yep, he said, slinging an arm around my shoulders and smiling down at me. Just to make it clear, 
I'm officially declaring you my girlfriend and declaring myself your boyfriend. Do I need to stop and weave some sort of promise necklace? I'm not ready to weave a ring yet. Out of seagrass? Or find you a seashell and carve our names inside of a heart or something? I laughed and bumped him with my shoulder. No need to get hasty with grass jewelry or carved seashells. Your declaration of boyfriendhood is good enough for me. A weight I didn't realize I'd been carrying lifted off my shoulders, and I smiled, forgetting for just a minute what a crappy situation we were facing. By then, we were at the end of the path to the tiki, and the smile slid off my face when we stepped over the spot where I'd found Dane. Dimitri, our second bartender, set a citrus water in front of me as soon as I sat down. Whereas Bob and I kept it simple, he fancied the drinking water up with oranges, lemons, and limes. It was a nice change of pace, and I took a sip of the cool, refreshing drink. Dimitri's hair was green this week, and I envied him his ability to change it at will. I probably could do it, but I'd have to use a spell that would be a constant draw on my energy. With my ginger complexion, I'd probably look good with purple hair. Dimitri slammed a hand onto his slim hip. Girl, you've had my main boss man in a tizzy. He was down here throwing a full-blown temper tantrum when he found out you and Bob had gone off property. No bueno. Not to mention, I had a hot date with an elf I had to cancel because of this mess. I hadn't given much thought to the fact that Dimitri was a fairy. I frowned. I'm sorry, sweetie. I hadn't considered the spot it was going to put you in. To be fair, though, Blake didn't give us the option. It was more of an order. He flapped a hand at me. I know. Siri and Aiden told me how it went down. And honestly, I didn't take much heat, and neither did they. I was more a witness than anything else. Blake, though, whoo-wee, he took the blame for sending you both away, and the king put that man through the ringer. Came down on him like a ton of bricks for letting you go. He pinched his lips together, and the sass in his gaze was replaced with concern. Still, I'm glad he, Siri, and Aiden got you to leave, though. It wouldn't have been pretty for either of you had you stayed. I'm not even sure it's a good idea for you to come back now. It would have been better if you'd stayed away till they punished that bloodsucker that killed him. I drew my brows together in disapproval. It wasn't like him to use racial slurs, and I called him on it. Hold up a minute. You can't hold what she is against her. You don't see me calling you an a-hole because you're a fairy just like the king is. He flushed, realizing too late what he'd said. I'm sorry, he said with a sigh. I guess I'm just glad they caught her so things can get back to normal around here. I shook my head and downed half my water. It was in the mid-90s, and my mouth was dry as sand. Don't get too comfortable just yet. I'll have you know I'm 100% sure they have the wrong person. That girl didn't kill Dane any more than you did. Colin had been quiet until then, but spoke up when Dimitri opened his mouth to protest. She's right, and since you're a fairy, you may be better situated to help clear her name than we are. Or at least you may have information that can help clear her. How so? Dimitri asked, refilling my glass from the large glass container sitting on top of the ice machine. He was in a shoving match with a blonde guy the afternoon before he was killed. I said, I saw it myself. And Margo said he had ill intentions when he passed her on his way inside with them. First, he said to Colin, I'm a little offended that you think just because I'm a fairy, that means I know all fairies. That's a little racist all on its own. Colin started to apologize, but Dimitri held up a hand. However, I'm willing to overlook it because in this case, you happen to be right. The guy you're talking about is Florian Redclove, Thalia's brother. He was with the king and his entourage when they came down. I looked at Colin, who shrugged. He didn't know any more than I did. Who's Thalia? Dimitri huffed out a breath. Don't you keep track of anything? Thalia is the bride-to-be. The girl Evan's marrying. Okay, I said, drawing out the word. 
So why would he push Dane? Because he thinks Dane cast aspersions on his little sister. Why does he think that? Colin asked. Tempest popped in at that moment. Because Dane questioned whether or not Thalia and Evan should marry. The problem is that the man worked himself into a fine fit of outrage for no reason. From what I understand, Dane thinks, thought, Evan's not quite ready to settle down yet and questioned whether marriage was a good idea. Florian took it as a personal slight because Thalia overheard part of the conversation and told Big Brother, Dane, didn't think she was good enough for Evan. I raised a brow at her. And how do you know that? Her furry little lips turned up in a cat that ate the cream smile. I was passing through the kitchen at the pizza place. Amelia and Janelle, two of the cooks there, are fairies, and they were discussing it. Tempest was a regular in all the kitchens because she had no shame at all when it came to begging for food. I usually got on to her for it, for all the good it did, but I let it pass this time. She'd gained information I never would have, so her gluttony worked in our favor for once. The implication of her words settled over me. Oh, for heaven's sake, are you telling me this whole thing is over some little twit who got her feelings hurt because she was eavesdropping, then took what she heard out of context? Tempest lifted a furry shoulder. Wars have been started over much less. They had indeed, and now some poor schmuck was dead, and I was going to have to mop up the mess and save an innocent life in the process. Chapter 16 I let that settle for a few minutes, my mind running through all the scenarios while we finished our water and munched on the chips and salsa Dimitri had set in front of us. While he was pouring a beer, Stephanie, the Valkyrie I mentioned earlier, stepped around the corner, making the green and gold bikini she was wearing look like something out of a Parisian fashion magazine. Of course, she was one of the most beautiful women I'd ever met, so a potato sack would look like high fashion on her. She slid onto the bar stool and adjusted her hair clip, which was holding her thick mane up into a messy bun. The spring on it snapped when she tried to put it back in. Scowling, she pulled it out of her hair and flung it into the trash can behind the bar. Cheap plastic, she snapped. I swear, these modern times claim to be superior to past generations, but almost everything is of inferior quality. I forgot my silver dwarf made clips at home, so I bought some of these from one of the fancy boutiques in the resort. That's the third one I've broken. The only thing elevated I've found about them is their cost. I've had my other set for over 300 years, and the only thing I've had to do is polish them when they get a bit bloodstained in battle. I did my best to hide my smile. The last thing I wanted was for an irritated Valkyrie to think I was laughing at her. I pulled a black scrunchie from my purse and handed it to her. Here, I think you'll find this works much better. She took it from me and put her fingers inside, testing the strength of the elastic before she pulled her hair through it a few times, leaving it in a messy bun with the final twist. Thank you, Destiny, she said. If you ever need an enemy dispatched, just let me know. This is the third or fourth favor you've done for me, and I don't forget my debts. That time, I did smile. I appreciate the offer and I'll keep it in mind. She ordered a white wine spritzer, then pulled her feet up under her so that she was sitting cross-legged on the stool. So what's been going on with you? She asked, taking a sip of her drink. Well, besides tripping over a dead fairy and having the fairy king searching high and low for me to dig through my brain, not much. How about you? She set her drink down on the bar, looking positively gleeful, likely because she saw an opportunity to pay back the conceived scrunchy debt. Are you saying this little man poses a threat to you? Dimitri was back and held up his hand. Wait a minute now. He's not exactly a little man in the scheme of things. Steph snorted. In the scheme of things, he's still a mortal man. I could smite him with one hand and not even drop my drink. It's quite literally what I was born to do. 
I bit back a grin because her expression was dead serious, and the image of her amused the more spiteful part of me. Still, it wouldn't be helpful to strike down the king of fairies no matter how big a tool he was. Hold up, Steph. I'm not sure any smiting is in order, but I have to say I'm glad to have you in my corner. Despite my reticence to let her strike willy-nilly, I wasn't above letting her do some smiting if somebody tried to turn my brain to mush. She gave a sharp nod before taking another sip of her wine spritzer. As your generation is prone to saying, damn straight, I've got your back, sister. Though it was no laughing matter, I smothered a giggle because it was kind of fun hearing modern slang coming from a woman who tended to speak Greek half the time. Ancient Greek at that. Thanks, I said, just as Blake popped around the corner, glancing over his shoulder. He looked like he'd been rowed hard and put away wet. His usual uniform of khaki shorts and white polo shirt was rumpled. He had a couple days' worth of stubble on his face, and I could pack for a weekend away using the bags under his eyes. Wow, Colin said. You okay, man? You don't look so good. Dimitri set two fingers of bourbon neat on the bar in front of Blake, and he tossed it back in one go. Not really, he said without even wincing when the booze hit the back of his throat. Your boss is a real ball breaker. Yeah, Dimitri said, pity on his face. He's no bundle of joy under the best circumstances, and these definitely aren't that. Though I felt horrible for him, or maybe because I did, I cut to the chase. Where's Marissa? She's innocent, and we can't let good King Kills a lot lop off her head or whatever it is he has planned before I can prove it. For that matter, why do they think she's guilty to begin with? He collapsed onto a stool beside Stephanie. Her fingerprints were found on the dagger. So? Our friendly neighborhood Valkyrie asked, shrugging. My fingerprints are on thousands of knives that have likely been used to murder somebody. That's not proof. Blake sighed and motioned for Dimitri to hit him again with another drink. It is to King Ian. Once we found the prince and the other princess confirmed she'd been in his room, that was all she wrote as far as he was concerned. But what about what Margot said? Colin pushed his empty beer glass forward, asking Dimitri for another beer. She insists Marissa was happy without a trace of anger, let alone murder in her heart. Blake shook his head. In one ear and out the other. I fail to see how a man this reckless has remained king without losing his head, Stephanie said. He must not have been front and center in any wars I oversaw, because he's the first type I picked to die. Odin had his faults, but he was fair overall. That was one of the reasons we served him. Yeah, that doesn't seem to be this guy, I said. Dimitri slid a fresh drink in front of Colin and splashed another healthy dash of bourbon into Blake's glass. Plus, there haven't really been any challenges to his rule. He's only ruled for a few hundred years. She nodded. That explains it, then. He ascended to the throne and hasn't been thoroughly tested. There haven't been many real wars in the land of fairy for a solid 400 years. Shame, really. Battle strengthens bonds and stiffens spines. A swirl of color popping around the corner behind her caught my eye, and I realized it was an older fairy accompanied by four guards. Based on the robes and crown, I had to assume we were now in the presence of royalty. I made a sawing motion at my throat toward Steph, warning her to be quiet, but she took it wrong. You're correct, she said, nodding sagely. A thousand years ago, he would have likely lost his head in any true battle. He's a king in name only. Ah, crap on a cracker. The king's expression turned thunderous as he came into her field of vision. When she pivoted on her stool to face him, she maintained her relaxed demeanor. I was probably the only one who noticed the slight stiffening of her posture. The king raised himself up to his full height and puffed out his chest. Young lady, I certainly hope t'was not to me you are referring. 
Steph reached around for her drink and took a sip before she answered. Are you Ian? Indeed I am, true king to the fairies. Then yes, she replied with a decisive nod, setting her glass back on the bar. I was referring to you. You question my status, he said, his lip curling and arrogance lacing his voice. Either he didn't know what the tattoos down her arms meant, or he was an idiot, or both. She shook her head. I do not. I question your fitness to hold it. Oh, man, crap was about to hit the fan. Chapter 17 the guards slapped their hands on the pommels of their swords, but jumped about a foot in the air when a loud whoosh of air blew their little hats off from behind right before the clatter of steel-shot hooves clattered on the ground. Buttercup, Stephanie's massive black-winged warhorse, had arrived and did not look pleased. He snorted and pawed the ground, his shoes making sparks on the pavement. He bobbed his head, setting his long ebony mane waving, and blew an anxious snort through his nose. It's okay, baby, Stephanie said, holding up her hand and cooing to him. Mama's got everything under control. She stood and strolled leisurely to him and patted him on the neck, her path wide open now that the king's men had skittered back several feet. She turned to the king. If you dispute my judgment and care to prove your worthiness, I'll give you the opportunity. I'll even leave Buttercup out of it. The Pegasus snorted and drew his brow low, obviously not pleased to be left out of the foray. Even though I'd fed him a hundred carrots and knew he was a big marshmallow most of the time, he was all business at the moment. His eyes, which were normally a soft chocolate, glowed red. If it weren't for the fact that the death of a second royal fairy would be hell on the resort's reputation as well as a political nightmare, I may have found the situation funny. After all, a hot barefoot chick in a bikini was challenging five armed men to a fight to the death and would no doubt win. One glance at Blake's gray face made me heave a sigh and step forward to intervene, but Steph waved me off. I'll even be sporting. She said to the king, widening her stance and bending a bit at the knees with one foot slightly behind her. I'll hold my drink in one hand and let you all attack at once. Still not even odds, but it's the best I can do. I hadn't even noticed that a mixed bag of guests, ranging from leprechauns, who were busy taking bets, to wide-eyed elven children were gathered in a semicircle around them. Things had gone far enough. I stepped between them before the guards, or the king himself, were stupid enough to pull their swords. Turning to Ian, I said, You do know what she is, right? Some impotent lass who has yet to be taught her place. He turned his attention to me. And I assume your destiny? I'd like to have a few minutes alone with you once this situation is handled. Rolling my eyes, I huffed out a breath. Once this situation is handled, you'll be fish food and so will your guards, and I'll likely have to clean up the mess. So let me introduce everybody. I'm Destiny Maganetti, the one who found your son's body. I'm sorry for your loss, but I've told Blake everything I know. You're not interrogating me. Stephanie, you're already aware this is Ian, King of the Fairy. King Ian? And this is important. This is Stephanie, Valkyrie to Odin. Steph nudged me from behind. Technically, it's Stephanie of Asgard. Odin's dead. I wobbled my head from shoulder to shoulder. My bad. Ian, meet Stephanie of Asgard. The long and short of it is she's a Valkyrie, and she'll pull your arms off and beat you and your guards to death with them. Well... I corrected myself. I guess she'll only beat you to death with one of your arms, since she's giving you the advantage of holding her drink in one hand. The king didn't look quite so sure of himself when I finished speaking. Now, are we all ready to be civil? I asked. Stephanie spoke around me. 
I am. As long as he agrees to leave you unscathed and free your friend from imprisonment so you may find the true murderer. I was looking forward to a day in the pool and don't wish to have to go back to my room to shower off the blood of battle before I do so. Nor do I want to leave you with that mess. That was the final straw for the good king, but it seemed he'd decided he didn't like the odds. He glared at me, then snapped, You have forty-eight hours! Spinning on his heel, he stomped off back in the direction he'd come from, guards in tow. Poor Blake slumped in his chair from relief, and a little color seeped back into his cheeks. You, I said, catching his gaze, are past the point of exhaustion. Get me the files to the case, please, then go get some sleep. We have two days, and I'm hoping it only takes me a few hours to clear this up. I have most of the information I need, so all I have to do is fit the pieces together. If I can't do that in the eight hours it takes you to get some Z's, you can help figure it out then. He stood up and opened his mouth to argue, but then shut it when his knees almost gave out. He snapped his fingers once, and the case file appeared in his hand. He gave it to Colin, snapped his fingers again, and was gone. I turned to Steph. Thanks, girl. You bought me the time I need to clear Marissa's name and find the evidence I need to bring the real killer to justice. Justice is what I do, she said, smiling like the cat who ate the canary. Plus, I told you I had your back. Buttercup snorted again, disappointed that battle had been avoided, then, with a whoosh of mighty wings, took to the air and settled in the shaded area we'd made for the unicorns, content to graze on the seagrass. Just another day in paradise. Chapter 18 Did anybody find out where Marissa is? I asked. She's locked in her room, Tempest replied. I couldn't get in to talk to her, though. Ian's thugs are guarding her. Come on, then. Let's find out what she knows so that maybe we can sort this mess out. I glanced at Colin. I'll be right back. He nodded. If you're not back in 15, I'm coming looking. Fair enough. I closed my eyes and took us to Margot. Did you get things settled? She asked, her tone anxious. The king swept past me toward the tiki like he owned the place, then came back looking like somebody'd set his buns on fire. I smiled. He thought he was going to teach Stephanie some manners. Oh, dear, she said, the corners of her stone mouth turning up in amusement. How was he dissuaded before she tore him apart? I gave her a brief rundown, and she was smiling when I finished. Good. I'm glad to see him taken down a notch or two. I understand the man's in mourning, but he's been running poor Blake ragged and being a heel in general to everybody around him. Yeah, I'm betting he'll be taking room service for the next day or two. Now I have to go free Marissa so we can get this mess sorted. That's probably for the best. Good luck, dear, she said, then resumed her usual pose staring out over the resort. I was standing in front of the elevators before I realized I didn't know what room Marissa was in. She's in 225, Tempest said as one of the doors slid open. We stepped inside after a couple of Gorgons stepped out, and I punched the button for the second floor. I didn't have to look at door numbers, It was obvious which one was hers because there were two mean-looking fairies standing guard outside it. Excuse me, I said as they moved in front of the door to bar my entrance. Nobody allowed in or out, one said, his expression brooking no argument. Was anything going to go easy for me? Call your boss. He'll not only tell you to let me in, he'll order you to let her out. The one who hadn't spoken laughed but it trailed off as I crossed my arms and cocked a brow at him. Tempest imitated my pose, and he pulled his phone from his pocket. Whomever he talked to wasn't being quiet, and it only took me a minute to identify the voice. It was the king himself. Let her in, but under no circumstances is the woman to be set free. 
I cleared my throat and stepped forward, holding my hand out for the phone. The guard creased his brow in confusion, but handed it to me. King Ian, this is Destiny Maganetti. I believe the deal you made with Stephanie and I included setting Marissa free. I held the phone away from my ear as he yelled expletives. When he took a breath, I put it back to my ear. Okay, Your Majesty, I'm putting your guard back on, and I'd appreciate it if you'd give the order to release her per our agreement. More grumbling, but the guard took the phone back and listened for a minute. Looking at his partner, he shrugged and turned to knock on the door. Marissa opened it as far as the chain would allow. You're free to go, the guard said, stepping away from the door and motioning for his buddy to follow him toward the elevators. She watched them go, then pushed the door shut long enough to slide the chain off. I stepped into the room and took a seat on the edge of her bed. What just happened? She asked. I gave her the rundown. Now we need to figure out who really did kill him. I wish I could help, she said, pulling her dark hair back from her face as she paced. All I know is I was at the beach this morning, and these men came and escorted me to the resort director's office. They asked me if I knew Dane and if I'd been in his room, and when I said yes, they locked me in here and told me I was charged with his murder. I thought of Colin, realizing this was his area of expertise, not mine. He'd planned to represent her, then the whole thing with Stephanie and the king went down, and our plans scattered to the winds. Get dressed, I told her. We're going to the tiki to figure this out. It only took her a couple minutes to put on her bathing suit and cover it up with a pair of shorts and a tank top. When we passed Margot, she grinned down at us. Congratulations, Marissa. Trust Destiny and her young man. They'll get everything straightened out. She had a lot more faith in me than I did because I had no idea how we were going to make the leap from suspecting who did it to proving it. Chapter 19 By the time we got back to the tiki, Colin had gone through most of the case file. He had what I like to call his lawyer face on and almost forgot to say hello before he started grilling her. Before we get into what's in the case file, tell me your version of events, he said, picking up the file and moving to a solitary table at the far corner of the patio. It was the same one that had been occupied by two trolls and Cassiel when he was killed. I'd insisted on replacing the table and chairs, but the picture of him lying slouched over the table, his cheek in a puddle of half-melted mango margarita, would likely be burned into my brain forever. Can we not sit there? I asked, moving to the table at the other corner. Or for that matter, we can go into the office. Outside is better for me, Marissa said. I've been locked up all day and prefer the air and sunshine. We took the table, then Colin focused on Marissa. Okay, start at the beginning when you first met Dean. She smiled. I was at the roulette table and felt somebody watching me. We played the whole glancing at each other and smiling game for a couple hours. Then he came over and introduced himself. We played a couple more games, then decided to go for a walk. There's this great beach, not the one at the tiki, but down farther. I nodded. It was what most of us referred to as the employee beach because most guests preferred to use the beach at the tiki. The one she was referring to was a good 10-minute walk, but blue-collar families used it sometimes because it was less formal and had a small playground and several charcoal grills and picnic tables shaded by huge oaks that only grew because of magically enhanced soil. Anyway, she went on, we came back and had a nice dinner. Then went to his penthouse for a movie. That thing has four bedrooms. When she realized how that might have come across, a slight blush tinged her cheeks. I swear, all we did was watch a movie and talk. Well, that and maybe some kissing. I noticed he was wearing a ring with jewels big enough to choke a horse, and I asked him about it because rubies are my favorite stone. 
At that point, he hadn't told me he was a prince or anything. I just thought he was a regular guy here on vacation. She took a deep breath. I was actually disappointed to find out he was royalty, because then I started asking myself why a prince would be interested in me. I rolled my eyes. She was drop-dead gorgeous and wondering about herself. Of course, she did have the whole new vamp thing going on, and I suppose losing your identity and realizing the entire world as you knew it was an illusion would be a kick to anyone's confidence. Okay, Colin said in an attempt to bring things back on track. What then? Dimitri brought us drinks, so she paused until he was done. When Dane found out I loved rubies, he went to the safe and pulled out a box with a knife in it. It had a huge ruby stone set in the end of it, and there were what looked like Celtic symbols engraved in the silver. It was beautiful. There were some smudges on it, so he polished it with a cloth, then handed it to me. He explained the handle and the significance of it. I handed it back, we talked for a while more, and I left. When was that? I asked. She pursed her lips together and pushed them to the side, thinking. That was the day before I met you. He said he had family things to do all day the next day, so I didn't see him again. He texted me a few times and snuck down to have a snack with me right after you left. And did you see him at all yesterday? Colin asked. She shook her head, then leaned up and tilted the umbrella so it was shading us more. He was surfing with his brothers and cousin. We were supposed to meet up on the beach by the tiki later that night, but he never showed. I waited for an hour, then walked down to the beach where we'd spent the day and just sat for a while, thinking about him and about life in general. Taking a sip of her water, she shook her head. Then this morning, they nearly dragged me off the beach, told me I was under arrest for murder, and here we are. Colin thought for a minute. Did you see him put the dagger back in his safe? She nodded. You're absolutely sure? This is important because if it was out, anybody could have stolen it. His gaze was intense. She shook her head. No, I'm positive he put it back. I heard the beeps when he reset the alarm. Colin sighed, and I could almost see that lawyer brain of his working. Okay, now we know how your prints got on the blade. The reports say there was another set they couldn't identify on there, too but you just said he polished it before he gave it to you. So that means whoever handled it did so after you touched it. They may just belong to the murderer. Great, I said, sarcasm dripping from my voice. So all we need to do is print everybody on the resort and get a match. Easy peasy. Just once, I would have liked to be able to say that with an utter absence of snark. Chapter 20 We ordered supper, and Marissa and I poured over the reports, scant though they were, while we waited for our food. Colin flipped a folder shut. I know it sounds like an uphill battle, but Blake did a lot of the work already. Both brothers can be ruled out because they have to use their fingerprints for identification. They were already in the system. I reined in my irritation and sighed. Well, that's a start anyway. I assume the bride's brother's prints are covered? Colin shook his head. No. From what it says here, it seems like the king stopped the investigation as soon as they identified Marissa's prints. Blake made some notes in the margin about it, but hadn't gotten that far yet. He was too busy dealing with the royal entourage and the resort's board of directors. A twinge of guilt shot through me because I'd left him hanging in order to save my own hide. He'd had more than his plate could hold, and I should have been there. Colin held up a finger as he flipped through a few more pages, then turned back and reread one. Did you find something? Marissa asked. He let out a breath. Maybe. It says here that the safe holding the knives had an extra ward. The only people who could open it, even with the code, were direct blood relatives of the king. I lifted a shoulder. So? 
So that means that, assuming Dane didn't take it out himself, whoever killed him, or rather, whoever took the dagger out of the safe, was a direct blood relation. It had to be either his father, who wasn't here, or one of his brothers. Then we need to talk to the brothers, I said. Are they even still here? A ruckus ensued at the tiki before he could answer, and I turned to see what was going on. A group of leprechauns with luggage were kicking up dust about something, so I went over to see what the fuss was about. Gentlemen, I said as I approached, what seems to be the problem? I'm the manager here, so being rude to the bartender isn't going to get you anywhere. For that matter, neither will being rude to me. The one who appeared to be the oldest and had been making the most noise stepped forward, scowling. The problem, lass, is that we need to go. We all have to work day after tomorrow, and we need a day to recover. I cocked a brow at them. Recover from vacation? I. He replied, sarcasm dripping from his voice. We've all imbibed a bit more than we should have and need a day to rest up to get ready to go back to work. I'm sorry, I said, but we have an ongoing murder investigation. That means nobody can come or go until that's solved. Until it's solved? His voice was an octave higher than it had been a minute before. What if it's never solved? That's not going to be the case, I replied. We're close to solving it now, but I can't do it if I'm wasting time dealing with people hassling my bartender. How about some courtesy casino chips? There was no way they were going to turn those down, and I had the clearance to hand them out, especially if it soothed ill will. Twenty-five dollars each. There were ten of them, so I figured it was worth two hundred and fifty bucks to shut them up. A younger man stepped forward, crossed his arms, and looked at me side-eyed. Fifty. Forty, I countered, scowling. Take it or leave it. You're stuck here either way. The first guy shoved the second one back and stuck out his hand. Deal, he said. Deal, I echoed, shaking his hand. They'll be credited to your accounts by the time you make it to the casino. Just give me your names. They did, and I made the call to let Chelsea, the girl working the bank cage in the casino, know what was up. After the leprechauns were on their merry way, I returned to our table. Callum was flipping through more of the documents, and Marissa was gazing out at the gulf with sadness in her eyes, lost in thought. I wondered what she was thinking. I pushed away the possibilities because feeling sorry for her wasn't productive. Helping her was... Why did they clear the guy who was yelling at Dane? Florian, the bride's brother? I asked. Colin didn't look up from the document he was reading. It doesn't really say, other than the king vouched for him. That wasn't good enough for me. My money's on him, though I have no idea how he would have gotten his hands on the dagger. He was the only one. Is it possible that somebody forgot to reset the ward or that Dane left it out of the safe for some reason? He shook his head. No, it says here it's self-setting. Every time the safe closes, it resets, and I can't imagine that he would have left it out. Maybe if it were a regular dagger, but not with its social and political importance. I lifted a shoulder. Then let's talk to Florian and to the brothers. There has to either be a way around the wards, or one of his brothers killed him. Even as I said it, I didn't think I was on the right track with the brothers. I'd met them and considered myself a good judge of character, and I couldn't imagine any of them killing him. Still, you could never tell. If murderers were easy to pick out of a crowd, there'd be far fewer killings. Plus, in my experience, nobody could hold a grudge like a family member. What about the cousin? I asked. Cedric, he was with them when they were surfing. Colin shook his head. He's not a direct relative, so he couldn't have accessed the dagger. Yeah, but neither could Florian. He's not related to them at all, Marissa pointed out. She huffed and slammed the folder in front of her shut. It's impossible. 
Nobody but me had access to the dagger. And yet there was another fingerprint on it, I said. It has to belong to somebody. Several long, silent moments later, Colin shook his head. What? Marissa asked. It's just... They don't really have any evidence on you other than the fact that your fingerprints were on the dagger. They didn't find anything on your clothes, and they didn't factor in the fact that you're much shorter than him. Nothing. It's like they just said, blame it on the vampire, brushed the dust off their hands, and walked away. Yep. Marissa said, popping the pee at the end of the word. That seems like it about sums it up. Have you told your sire yet? Ben, right? I asked. Yeah. She sighed and slumped her shoulders. Unfortunately, he can't get onto the resort because of the lockdown. I hadn't thought of that. I'd hoped she'd have some support coming, but it looked like that wasn't going to be a thing. Blake would likely lift the wards to let them in, but unless she was convicted, having an angry parent on the grounds might just be throwing fuel on the fire. He's not happy, though, she continued, picking at a coaster. He's contacting his attorneys, for all the good that will do right now. He wants access to the case and told me not to talk to anybody until he straightens it out. Smart man. Okay, so I say we talk to the brothers and to the bride's brother again. Colin nodded. They're in room 544, Marissa said. It's a penthouse suite, or at least the brothers are. I don't know about Florian. Then let's go talk to them, I replied, scraping my chair back and standing. We aren't accomplishing anything sitting here. Tempest popped in out of breath. I've been wandering around, seeing what could be seen, and overheard a blonde fairy talking on his cell. He was assuring somebody that he'd taken care of it. Marissa looked at her with a little hope in her eyes for the first time since I'd sprung her from her imprisonment. Colin flipped around a picture of Florian. Is this the guy? Tempest jumped up onto my lap and took a closer look. Sure is, she said, nodding. He stood up, and so did Marissa. Closing the file, he motioned for us to follow. Come on, kids. We've got a suspect to investigate. Chapter 21 It took longer than I would have preferred to make it to the resort because we had to walk it. Marissa wasn't ready to let me teleport with her, so it wouldn't have done any good to take Colin and then wait for her. My feet were already tired from the day, and the thought flitted through my head that I should have worked. At least then I would have some cash to show for my aching tootsies. On the way, I called the front desk and got Florian's room number. I would have bet the farm he was the killer, and I wasn't willing to burn any more daylight, not that there was much left, before we talked to him. We were waiting for the elevator when a group of vampires stopped us. Are you Marissa? A tall, willowy woman with dark hair asked. The red cocktail dress she was wearing cost more than I made in a good month. Marissa nodded. I am. My name is Estelle Moran. Ben reached out to us and asked us to watch after you. She narrowed her eyes and shot Colin and me the hairy eyeball. We're not letting you leave this resort, nor will we allow you to receive any punishment unless and until the case is fairly resolved to our satisfaction. I sighed. Though I was glad Marissa had somebody watching out for her, this woman meant business. With the way King Ian was behaving, things could get ugly fast, and the last thing we needed was a battle between vampires and fairies. Among paranormal species, they were two of the most unpredictable and volatile races, and one wrong move could set off a war. Colin stepped forward. We couldn't agree more. We're doing everything we can to get to the bottom of it. Destiny and another friend dealt with the king earlier. They only bought us two days, but were hoping to solve it way before then. Estelle studied him for a long moment, and the three other vampires stood at the ready. He's telling the truth, Marissa said. They're on my side, and the Valkyrie, too. 
Estelle smiled, though it was more predatory than friendly. We saw the interaction earlier. It would have worked out well if that silly man would have been foolish enough to take her up on her challenge. I shook my head. No, as much as I dislike him, it wouldn't have. There's a way to resolve this peacefully, and that's what we're going to do. It's in the best interests of everybody involved. Estelle paused for another moment, then relented. Fine, but here's my number, Marissa. Store it in your phone, and if anything happens, call me. We'll be there in moments. Marissa pulled out her phone and added Estelle. You too, the older vampire told me. I don't want anything left to chance. If they take her phone, you contact me. I nodded and took her number. I'm sure we won't need to use this, but I have it just in case. Estelle sighed and shook her head. I've learned that when it comes to vampire persecution, it's best to leave nothing to chance. Sadly, she was right. They were one of the few groups of supernaturals who hadn't managed to shed the stereotype. With one more assurance to Marissa that she wasn't alone, Estelle and her group drifted away toward the casino. That was incredible, Marissa said, her eyes glistening. I don't even know those people. That would have never happened when I was a human. Her voice held a trace of wonder, and I hoped that if nothing else, Estelle had made her feel a little more accepted. I smiled at her as we stepped out of the elevator, and she returned it. Florian's room was at the end of the hall, and a room service cart sat outside his door cluttered with dirty dishes. It seemed he wasn't feeling sociable. Colin knocked, and a moment later, the blonde man I'd seen arguing with Dane the day before opened the door. Yes? He asked, his gaze breaking over us with disdain. Mr. Red Clover, I'm Destiny Maganetti, a manager here at the resort, and this is Colin. He's one of the legal representatives for the resort. That part was true, so I didn't bother telling him that Colin wasn't exactly working in that capacity at the moment, or maybe he was. It was his job to watch out for the best interests of the resort, and not prosecuting the wrong person for a murder fell under that umbrella. I'd omitted introducing Marissa, hoping he'd let it slide, but par for the course of the day, he didn't. And who's that? He asked, then his nose curled when he sniffed, and a look of disgusted realization crossed his face. She's a vampire. Don't tell me she's that vampire the one who killed Dane. I gave him a not-so-nice smile and resisted the urge to smack that smug, condescending expression right off him. I won't, because she's not the one who killed him. That was all I was willing to give him. Colin stepped up. May we come in? We have some questions for you, and I'd rather not ask them here in the hall. Though his expression and posture made it clear that he wasn't okay with it, he stepped back and made a sweeping gesture for us to enter. Once we were inside, he turned to us. This is ridiculous. Why would I kill Dane? My family stood to benefit from the Union. Though I knew family was everything to fairies, there were two sides to that coin. His family stood to benefit from a merger between them and the royals, but nothing said the groom had to be Dane. With what Thalia had overheard, maybe he'd gotten it into his head that maybe she'd be better off with Kalen, the next brother in line for the crown. Tempest climbed onto my shoulder. Then maybe you can explain what you were warning Dane about on the beach and why I overheard you telling somebody on the phone that something was taken care of. We waited for him to answer. His fair cheeks went red, and if the fire in his eyes was any indication, it wasn't from embarrassment. What I did or didn't say in either situation is none of your business. Colin crossed his arms and a dark brow shot up. Oh, I beg to differ. Your king gave us clearance to investigate this case. What the suspect says is very much our business if it's related to finding who murdered the prince. Florian started to say something, but snapped his mouth shut. He pivoted and strode to the minibar and poured himself a scotch without offering us anything. 
I tamped back a smile at the slight. He took a sip and winced when the liquor hit the back of his throat. Fine. Dane made it known that he didn't think Evan should marry my sister unless he loved her. I don't know if what she said is actually what she overheard, or if Dane was just concerned that neither of them are ready to honor the contract. It doesn't matter. The deal was struck when they were just children, so encouraging the nonsense about backing out would have been a breach of contract. I reminded him of that on the beach. He started to protest, or maybe explain, but there was nothing to be said. That's when I told him he was warned. I tilted my head at him. Okay, and who were you talking to on the phone? And before you lie, remember that I can get your records. That was a lie, but he didn't know that. He ground his teeth and slammed back the rest of his drink. I was talking to my assistant. She wanted to know if I'd signed the papers finalizing a merger. I told her it was taken care of. And what exactly was this merger that you were so eager to push through? Marissa asked. Florian narrowed his eyes at her. I don't see where that's relevant to Dane's murder. She lifted a shoulder, and I was glad to see her taking up for herself. I wondered if she was that way naturally, or if the support from Estelle had boosted her confidence. Considering you threatened him on the beach, I'd say it is. I guess we won't know if it's relevant or not until you explain it to us, though. One of my companies had been in negotiations with one of the kings, real estate. It's all above board and has no bearing on the situation. The deal has no ties to the marriage. Colin's expression was speculative. I glanced at the other two to see if they had any questions, and Colin asked the most obvious one. Where were you when Dane was killed? And were you ever in his room? He smirked at us. Unless I'm mistaken, they've printed the room. Mine weren't found, so that answers that question. As far as my whereabouts, I was here doing business all evening. And yes, I was alone. Well, that was worth exactly nothing to us. It neither proved nor disproved his guilt or innocence. Anything else I can help you with? He asked, his tone thick with sarcasm. I am, after all, a captive audience. Not right now. If we have any more questions, we'll be back. Colin turned on his heel without another glance back. For what it's worth, Florian said as we were walking out the door. Dane was the best of the three. I know my sister was worked up by what she thinks she heard, but I took that with a grain of salt. She's young, and I think the match would have settled into a good one eventually. I nodded and sighed as we left. That hadn't helped at all, at least not to convince me he was the murderer. He hadn't cleared himself, but he hadn't pushed me closer to believing he was guilty either. We were back to square one. Chapter 22 the brothers opened the door as soon as we knocked. At first, I thought it was a bad idea for Marissa to go, but she'd insisted, and I figured it would be good to see their knee-jerk reactions to her anyway. Kalen opened the door, and after his initial shock, he stepped back, motioning for us to enter. Evan and Cedric were both there too, so it would be easier, or harder, to talk to them. On one hand, it would be better to question them separately, but we decided on the walk up that if they were guilty, they'd have plenty of time to get their stories straight anyway. Dad said you'd probably be stopping by, Evan said, pulling up a chair at the conference-style table that sat in what was supposed to be the dining room. We're actually glad you did, Kalen said. Something isn't right. He looked toward Marissa. We're fairly certain you didn't kill him, and we don't understand why our father is being so insistent. And not to be inappropriately irreverent, but I'd love to meet this Stephanie. I can't imagine there'd ever be a dull moment with a woman like her. I smiled, despite the gravity of the situation. No, dull isn't a word that'll ever be used to describe her, I said. 
Though she's going to be a hard catch, she's been single for millennia. I love a challenge, he replied, smiling. Just the thought was entertaining. I'd seen several men hit on her, and she always turned them down flat. Mythology described them as maidens, and I had to wonder if that was meant in the biblical sense. Nah, not possible. Steph was so vibrant, I couldn't imagine that she'd never... Just, nope. Not possible. She'd challenge you, all right, I told him. No doubt about that. Knock yourself out, but don't be surprised if she knocks you out. Marissa cleared her throat. As lovely as I think it would be for you to find a woman worthy of you, I'd love to clear my name so I can get on with my life, too. Of course, Evan said. I'm so sorry for the way my brother has gone on. He glared at Kaylin. I found it a little odd that he was thinking about his next conquest with his brother dead less than 24 hours. But maybe that's how he was dealing. People grieved in different ways. Evan's right, said Kaylin. It's inappropriate, and I don't mean to sound as if I don't care. I do. A great deal. Please, sit. Once we all had a place at the oval table, we dug straight in. Colin cleared his throat. Let's start with where the three of you were when Dane was killed. Cedric went first. I was down walking on the beach. Evan can back me up. I messaged him to come have a beer with me, but the tiki was already closed. Evan nodded. He did. Kaylin and I were playing poker, so I told him to come join us instead. We hadn't seen Dane. His gaze drifted to Marissa. We assumed he was with you. He wasn't, she said. He texted me a few hours before I heard about his death and asked me to come to the beach. I was in the shower when he texted, so I didn't get it. By the time I responded, he didn't answer. Her chin quivered. I think he must have already been dead. My heart went out to her, and I resolved to put this to bed so she could get past it. She had a whole new life ahead of her. Yesterday morning, when I was working and talked to you guys for the first time, you didn't seem thrilled at the prospect of getting married. I said to Evan. Evan sighed. I'm not particularly. I like Thalia well enough, and she'll make a fine mother, and someday a great queen, but I'm not in love with her. I want to find that one woman. Marissa looked confused. Since she'd only been in the paranormal world a short time, the concept of an arranged marriage was likely antiquated to her. Shoot, for that matter, it was antiquated to me, too. But at least I knew it was still common practice in some circles. So why are you marrying her, then? Evan lifted one half of his mouth in a smile. I have no choice. I'm the heir, and I have to marry her. This union was arranged when we were both just children. They still do that? she asked. That is absurd, just the thought of it. In our world, they do, Kaylin answered. Though I'd been told the answer, I wanted it from the horse's mouth. I turned to Evan. I understand there was an issue with Thalia overhearing something Dane said, was he upset that you were marrying Thalia because he didn't like her, or just that he didn't think you were ready to get married at all? Evan huffed a breath out his nose. The latter, of course. Dane would never say something bad about her. Like the rest of us, he liked Thalia. He just didn't think I'm ready to be married yet, and that's all he said. He disagreed with the entire construct of an arranged marriage, Thalia tends to be a bit high-strung and took what she overheard the wrong way. And then Florian took it the wrong way, I said. Kaylin nodded, grim. That's about the gist of it. So let me ask, Marissa said, leaning forward and looking them in the eye by turn. Do you think Florian could have killed Dane? The table was silent for a few moments, and it bordered on uncomfortable. Of course... I guess it had to be difficult imagining anybody you know would go so far as murder. Honestly, Evan said, I think it's a good possibility. 
The other men echoed his sentiments. And that would also explain why father's been so strange about it. He'd rather see an innocent person convicted than breach a contract and lose money and face. Wow, it was cold when even your kids think you'd throw an innocent under the bus just to save face. I shook my head. I don't know what kind of warped system you folks have, but I'm glad it's not the one I have to follow. Cedric took a deep breath. It's not like that ordinarily. We're peaceful people who respect each other and honor our words. He looked down at the table and brushed away imaginary dust, grief clouding his face. It's just that we're like every other species. Some of us are worse than others. What he didn't need to say was that his uncle was one of them. That doesn't explain the dagger, though, said Marissa. The men turned to her. What do you mean? Kalen asked. I mean, the charm or whatever on the safe. Nobody who's not related to your father could open it. I assume he made that arrangement when he reserved the suite. They looked back and forth between each other. We didn't know anything about that. Evan said, sighing. But then again, Father doesn't usually take the time to tell us about details he feels are irrelevant to us. Kalen pressed his lips together. Half the time, he doesn't give us the details that are relevant. Still, it's a thing, Colin said. So how did he breach it? Are you sure Dane didn't accidentally leave it out of the safe? Cedric spoke up again. The Red Cloves are known for their powerful magic and father, though powerful tends to rely on others for security. It's possible that if he's the one who set the ward, he didn't add the layers necessary to make it fully functional. If that was the case, then Florium would have perhaps been able to breach it. The possibility swirled in my brain, but nothing was adding up. It was almost nine o'clock, and I'd squeezed more into one day than I usually did into a week. I was on information overload and needed some downtime to process it all. Thanks for your time, gentlemen, I said, rising. I'm sure we'll have more questions, but that's all for tonight. Melissa shot me a surprise look, but didn't say anything until we were in the hall. We have to solve this tonight. I rubbed my temples and yawned. We're not going to solve it tonight unless somebody just flat out confesses. I'm sorry. We'll reconvene first thing in the morning. Don't worry, Colin said, his voice gentle. We will find out who did this before your time is up. We just can't do it when we're too exhausted to think, okay? Tomorrow. Though her face was pinched, she nodded. I forgot how much energy it takes to be a human. I still need sleep, but I can run on much less than I did before I was changed. Get some sleep. I appreciate all you're doing for me. We walked her back to her room, and just for my own peace of mind, I said a word on it so that nobody uninvited could get in. I couldn't protect her from being dragged out if the king or his men decided to play dirty in the dark of night, but I could darn sure make sure I knew about it. Chapter 23 by the time we made it back to my place, I was about to fall over from exhaustion. I'd insisted on teleporting us because the thought of walking that far had been unbearable. We were no sooner home than Myla called. I slid my finger across the screen to answer. Hey, I hope you're not calling for help with some algebraic formula for a potion or something. My brain couldn't even match a sock at this point. She laughed. No, I promise you this here and now, I will never, ever call to ask for help with algebra because it's Satan and we're good witches. Fear of being sent to purgatory where I'm forced to do math for eternity is what keeps me from turning some people to stone. I grinned. Okay, then. As long as we're on the same page. What's up? Since you left, I've had the standard run of rumor mill members come through, and I'm a little confused by some of the stuff I've heard. Have you solved the case yet? I set my purse down on the table and kicked my shoes off. No? Why? Have you heard something that might help? 
She paused. I assume Colin and Tempest are there, right? Put them on speakers so we have more than just our brains working on this. Pulling my phone away from my face, I tapped the icon so everybody could hear her. Okay, done. Go ahead. Colin and Tempest gathered around me as I took a seat at the kitchen table. I slid my phone to the middle. So, at first, I thought this King Ian was just your standard run-of-the-mill jerk, but that's not what people who know anything about the family are saying. According to them, it's true that he can be hot-headed, but he's never intemperate. He doesn't make snap decisions, and by nearly all accounts, he's fair and thorough. Tempest huffed. That sure wasn't the impression we got. He decided Marissa was guilty, and that was the end of things. Exactly my point, Myla said. That's not how he works. At first, I wrote it off to prejudice, but then I found out one of his best friends is a vampire. They go on golfing vacations at least a couple times a year, so that's not it. Though I felt like I was slogging through molasses, I tried to cipher out what that could mean. Maybe it's just because it's his son, Colin suggested. People do horrible things in grief. Maybe, she said. But his brother was killed a few hundred years ago or so, right after he became king. By all accounts, they were close. The punishment was horrible, but even in that situation... He went to the effort to put forth a thorough investigation and a fair trial. I sighed. Something's not right here, then. No, it isn't. We're missing something. What would make a man who, by most accounts, is fair, rational, and deliberate do something like rush to pin a murder on the first person who has an iota of evidence pointing to them? She paused to open up the question for thought. After a few moments, Colin sighed. Family. Bingo! Myla exclaimed. That's the only thing that makes sense to me, too. He's protecting someone. A few pieces clicked into place, but I still didn't have enough for a definitive answer. It wasn't much more than we'd had before, but it brought things into focus. Understanding his motivation was a critical piece of the puzzle because now we at least knew he was protecting somebody. Now, just to figure out who. There was another print on the dagger, but the king got a little high and mighty about it from what we read in the reports, I told her. He got in the way of fingerprinting Florian, one of the guys I think may have done it, vouched for him himself and said it was unnecessary. But that still leaves the fact that nobody could access the safe except for the brothers, Tempest pointed out, then yawned. As usual, it was contagious. I followed suit, then Colin did too. You're the bomb, cousin, I said. I should have seen this, but didn't. You had no way to know that wasn't just how he is, she replied. But you sound exhausted. Get some sleep and start over in the morning when you have more than three fire and brain cells. I laughed, though there wasn't much energy in it. I'll do my best. Thanks, Myla. I appreciate your help. Love ya. Love you, too, and take care of yourself. You can't help anybody if you drop dead from pushing yourself too hard. We disconnected, and I rubbed my temples. We're missing something. I said again, stretching my feet out to work the kinks out of my arches. I just don't know what. We are. Colin pushed his chair back and stood. But tomorrow's going to have to be soon enough to figure out what. Twenty minutes later, I was under my covers. In another thirty seconds, I was passed out cold. Despite the stress and the weight of responsibility I was carrying, I slept like a rock. What dreams I could remember were strange and disjointed, which wasn't surprising, but overall, I woke up ready to get back to the business of crime solving. I had a text from Blake waiting for me when I checked my phone. He'd cleared my schedule for the next two days so that I could focus on the investigation. That wasn't exactly healthy for my wallet, 
but missing a day or two of work would be worth it if I could save somebody's life and put a murderer out of commission. I was standing in the shower, enjoying the hot water running over my head, and sort of letting all the information I'd gathered over the last couple of days free flow through my thoughts when it came to me. All the pieces clicked into place, and the hot water suddenly felt cold. I shut it off, then almost killed myself climbing out of the tub when my foot hit the wet tile instead of the mat. Colin! I yelled. Get dressed! I know who did it! He rushed into the bathroom just in time to catch me as I skidded across the floor, drying myself off as I went. I just finished making breakfast. Omelets. The downtrodden look on his face would have been comical if I hadn't been in such a rush. Well, it still was, and maybe even funnier that I'd told him I'd solved the murder, but he hadn't been able to peel his mind far enough away from food to even ask. I yanked a tank top and pair of jean shorts from my dresser. We can eat later. No! Tempest poked her nose out from under the covers and yawned. We can take ten minutes to eat. Nobody's going anywhere, and we skipped supper last night, if you remember. That explained why my poor stomach was rumbling like I hadn't eaten in a week. Fine, I said, unable to focus on much more other than the smell of bacon and coffee. But ten minutes, that's it. Then we've got a murderer to arrest. Man, did it ever feel good to say that. Chapter 24 Five minutes later, we each had a plate full of cheese omelets, bacon, and toast. Well? Tempest waved a slice of bacon at me. Are you going to tell us or make us guess? I paused with my fork halfway to my mouth. I'd planned to just tell them, but then thought maybe it would be best if I presented the clues in the order my brain had processed them to see if they reached the same conclusion I had. I took a swig of coffee. Actually, I'm going to make you guess. Well, I'm going to lay out the pieces and see if you put it together in the same way I did. Then shoot. Colin sat around a mouthful of eggs. You're killing me. Okay, so we know the safe can only be opened by somebody who's a blood relative of the king, and we know he's protecting somebody. It's the only rational explanation for his behavior. I stopped talking long enough to shove half a slice of bacon into my mouth and chew. I'm with you so far, Tempest said. Continue. I scowled at her as I struggled to swallow. Colin rolled his eyes. Don't choke to death before the big reveal. That earned him a glower, too, and I took another drink of my coffee just to be perverse. Fine. Shane told us when we went to the cracked cauldron that he'd heard his wife and her sister gossiping about Thalia having a boyfriend. And before that, when we were talking to Ingrid at the bed and breakfast, she said she'd heard all sorts of rumors, including ones about illegitimate children. Also, Siri told us that the king had been in love with his childhood sweetheart when he had to abide by the arranged marriage contract. I stopped talking and shoveled a big bite of omelet into my mouth while I let them think. Colin got there first. I could see the exact moment the light bulb came on from his aha expression. He grinned and tossed down the bacon he'd been holding. A big act indeed, especially for a werewolf. So you're saying there's an illegitimate son running around the resort? I am, I replied. And not just an illegitimate son, an eldest son. And that he was in love with Thalia, Tempest added, her expression speculative. But that would only work if Evan was the dead one. That was a stumbling block I hadn't worked my way around yet, but my gut told me I was dead on target. Yeah, but I know I'm right. It feels right, especially when I tell you the next piece. Tempest rolled her eyes. Do tell. The suspense is simply too much. I sighed. The day they were in the tiki, they were ribbing each other about getting married. Evan teased Cedric, and Cedric replied that Evan got the only good one left, or something along those lines. I don't know why I'd remembered that, but my brain tended to work in mysterious ways when I was in the shower. 
It was like it was hydro-powered or something. Or maybe it was because I liked the water so hot that the steam put me in a hypnotic state. Whatever, it didn't matter how it worked, just that it did. Cedric, they said at the same time. I nodded, pleased as punch with myself. Yep, he's not their cousin after all. He's their older brother. We finished breakfast, and Colin made us both a cup of coffee to go against my protests. I'm no good without a second cup, and neither are you. I couldn't argue with that, so I just took it, gave him a quick kiss for being considerate, then held my hand out. He furrowed his brow and gave me the hairy eyeball, but I wasn't having any of it. I wasn't taking the ten minutes to walk to the resort when I was perfectly capable of getting us there in ten seconds. Tempest hopped on my shoulder, and with a final grumble, Colin took my hand right as I closed my eyes. Margot jumped a little when I landed beside her, something I'd never seen her do. Why, good morning, Destiny Colin, Tempest. Is all well? I tilted my head and examined her. She was rock solid, no pun intended, and it was strange that I'd caught her by surprise. We're good. Better than good, actually. We solved the murder. Or at least we figured out who did it. We haven't got the last piece in place yet, but I'd bet the farm that we've got it right. Are you okay? You seem a bit jumpy. She heaved a sigh of relief. I'm much better now that you said that. I was up most of the night talking to Marissa. She couldn't sleep, so I kept her company. Having a murderer here weighs on me, too. Back in the old days... I was used to dark plots and people killing each other over piddling things, but I've come to enjoy the peace of this place. Murder doesn't belong here. Tempest jumped up on her base and rubbed her head against Margot's paw. You're right, and we figured it all out. Don't let it worry you another minute. I smiled. She's right. Marissa's going to be fine, and the resort can get back to normal just as soon as we go wrap it up. Then do that, dear. Margot sighed, her stone forehead still creased a little. I'll feel better once you do. I nodded and patted her paw on my way past her, and Colin gave her a kind smile. Once we were inside the lobby, it seemed like the elevator took forever. Should we get Marissa first? Tempest asked, her paw hovering over the floor button. I nodded. Yeah. She deserves to be there. Blake, too, Colin said. You have to let him know what we're doing. A little wisp of guilt flitted through me because I hadn't even thought to call him. I remedied that as soon as we stepped out of the elevator on Marissa's floor. We figured it out, I announced when he answered, then gave him the short version. I'll meet you in the royal suite, he said without even bothering to say goodbye before he hung up. Marissa was a mess when she answered the door. Dark circles marred her porcelain skin, and her eyes were dull. She swung the door wide. Hey, guys, come on in. We did, and she turned to us after she closed the door. Please tell me you've got good news. I haven't slept a wink. Her demeanor told me she wasn't holding out much hope. Tempest hopped up on her bed and sat down, wrapping her tail around her feet. Actually, we do. Destiny figured it out. Marissa pivoted toward us, her posture straightening with hope. Are you sure? I nodded. There are still a couple details we haven't quite worked out yet, but I'm confident we know who did it. She took a seat beside Tempest. Then please tell me. The three of us took turns spelling out all the logical steps we'd taken to get to the killer's identity. So it's Cedric. Her voice was soft. But why would he want to destroy me? I lifted a shoulder. We don't know that he did. For that matter, we don't even know why he targeted Dane rather than Evan. That part doesn't make any sense, but the rest does. Then let's go get the answers to the few remaining questions, she said, her shoulders square with determination. I'd like to get on with my life now that I know I have centuries of possibility ahead of me. Kaylin and Evan were in their suite still in jogging shorts, but Cedric was not.
Kalen slugged down half of the green drink he was holding. Why do you need Cedric? I hedged, not sure if I wanted to launch into the story until I had them all together or not. Marissa made the choice for me. Because he committed the murder I'm accused of. The corners of her eyes welled with pink tears. Dane was a wonderful person, and your brother deserves whatever horrible punishment you have in store for him. Confusion crossed both fairies' faces, but Evan was the one to speak first. I'm afraid I don't understand. Why would you think Dane deserved some sort of punishment? I shook my head. No, not Dane. Cedric. He's your brother. I'm certain tests will confirm that. Tests don't have to, a tired voice said from behind me. I turned, and the king was leaning in the doorway. She's right, boys. Cedric is your brother, not your cousin. His eyes took on a faraway look. Back before your mother and I were married, I was in love with a magnificent woman named Ashira. Ian paused, and his mouth curved into a soft smile. Ironically, she was named after an ancient goddess of fertility. We grew up together, but I was honor-bound to marry your mother. I swore fidelity to her once we'd spoken our vows, but by then, Ashira was already pregnant. She died in childbirth, and I promised her on her deathbed that I'd care for Cedric, raise him and educate him and love him. The smallest of gusts would have knocked both Evan and Kaelin over if their shell-shocked expressions were anything to go by. And where's Cedric now? Colin asked. We need to question him and find out why this happened. A ruckus ensued outside the doorway. Hey, watch it! A woman's voice shrieked right before a grand crash of plates and cutlery. The king, who was the only one who could see into the hall, called out, Cedric! Please, let me explain. Ian turned to us. He must have overheard. We all dashed into the hallway, but the doorway to the stairs at the other end of the hall clunked shut before we even made it to the elevators. Rather than wait, I bolted down the hallway toward the stairs with Colin, Marissa, and the brothers right behind me. We were only on the second floor, so it didn't take long to hit the lobby, but Cedric was almost to the front doors of the resort by the time we did. I smiled, knowing we had him. No way was he getting past Margot. Still, I wasn't willing to take the chance. She'd been a little off her game that morning, so just in case, I gave pursuit. As luck would have it, Cedric decided to make a stand right beside her. He stopped and turned as we ran out the front doors, holding his hands in front of him. I couldn't tell what spell he was using, but he was mumbling and forming a ball of magical light between his hands. Ian did raise me, he called across the space, and I could hear the bitter resentment in his tone even from there. But I'd hardly call what he did loving me. He didn't claim me as his firstborn son. He didn't claim me at all. I should have been the one marrying Thalia, not Evan. The ball of light between his hands grew bigger, and I summoned my own magic. Before I could use it, though, Margot leapt off her pedestal. Sand drifted through the air as she roared and jumped forward, her stone tail twitching like a giant cat's. Cedric had no chance to fire off his magic before she snaked her head out and snatched him. Turning, she trotted back toward me, the angry fairy clenched between her teeth. What do you want me to do with him? She asked, her voice muffled from trying to speak around him. That depends on him, Blake said from behind me. I pivoted and grinned at him. Better late than never, right? He smiled back, and I was happy to see his face had regained its color and that he looked much more rested and healthy than he had the day before. Margot, if you'd be a deer and drop him, my guys will take it from here. Three security guards rushed past me, their magic so strong it was palpable. As soon as they made it to Margot, she unceremoniously dropped Cedric at their feet. Take him away, boys. She grinned at me, then lowered her head so that I was the only one who could hear her. I've always wanted to say that. 
Other guests had squeezed by, their expressions ranging from delight to fear at seeing a massive sphinx standing battle ready in the courtyard with a fairy in her mouth, her tail twitching back and forth like a giant cat's. Or lions, I suppose. I grinned back at her. I'm glad you got it in then. Thank you. She winked at me. Nobody threatens my girl with magic. Her expression turned serious. Or murders people on my resort. You'll see that justice is done. Otherwise, I'll just chomp him now. Blake stepped forward, smiling. I'm not personally against that, but I suppose we'll take things from here. As always, thank you for guarding our resort. She dipped her head at him in acknowledgement, then climbed back onto her pedestal and settled back into her relaxed position. Before she went stony again, though, she turned to Blake. I hate to say I told you so, but this is the man I told you about. Blake pressed his lips together, but didn't reply. What could he say, really? I strode to where the guards were holding Cedric, and the others followed. I get why in your twisted way you would have wanted to kill Evan, but why Dane? From everything I've learned, he was the one person who was remotely on your side. He was against the marriage. Cedric stood, shoulders slumped, and misery etched on his face. It was supposed to be Evan. I took Dane's dagger from the safe, then messaged Evan and waited for him at the back of the tiki. His expression took on a faraway look. I buried that dagger in Dane's back before I realized he wasn't Evan after all. Marissa stepped forward and slapped him hard enough to rattle his teeth. That was for Dane. But what did I ever do to you? Why did you set me up? He shook his head. I'm sorry. That was never the plan. I was going to kill Evan with it, then clean it and get it back in the safe before anybody noticed it was gone. It was the perfect crime, except... Except you killed the wrong brother. Colin shook his head in disgust. Yes, except for that, and I panicked and left the dagger. Cedric hung his head. I sighed, not sure whether to hate him or feel sorry for him. In the end, I decided to do neither. My part in it was over, and I was just glad to get away from it. We'd saved Marissa from them, and that was good enough for me. This has been The Surfboard Slang, an Enchanted Coast Cozy Mystery, Enchanted Coast Magical Mystery Series, Book 2, written by Tegan Marr, narrated by Megan Kelly, copyright 2018 by Tegan Marr, production copyright by Tegan Marr.